with the angle of the hook, when you go to set that hook, the jig's gonna rotate. So with the angle, it's gonna drive it right up into that lift. Top speed as fast as you can crank it with the, a 15 mile an hour east wind in your face. And that's where you're gonna find all these flatfish. There's all those troughs right on the edges of the sandbars. If, if people wanna put themselves in that dangerous situation, let them, don't, don't follow them. Um, if you're uncomfortable, stick to your guns. Don't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> 90% of everything in their stomach content is going to be it's going to be muscles. But these are the same ones I target like world class tarpon with when I'm going vacation. You want to put that bait on so a lot of the bait is, is stacked up on the on the shaft of the hook and a lot of that hook is exposed with the bait laying up by the shaft of the hook. Dang, you go deep when you when you're talking <laughs> rods. I love it. But if I'm going to go for big fish, I, I've learned to throw bigger plugs and and they'll produce. I mean. All right, everybody, welcome to Fat Dad Fishing Show. My name is Rich. I am the host of the show. And tonight, actually, I'm flying solo as far as co host So Ed and John both have the uh, vacation day today. So uh, they're not going to be joining us. However, and I'm going to bring them on stream right now. We do have our friend of the show, Qua from Tide Chasers Podcast, is on tonight. And he is the big guest. Qua, how are you doing today? Good, good, good. How are you doing over there, Rich? What's going on? It I'm doing well. Um, you know, we were talking uh, right before we opened up the stream tonight. Qua and I were both um, we we're both sitting in on the striped bass uh, meeting for New Jersey, and we didn't have a lot of time to talk about it because I, it actually might still be going right now. Uh, so we we were able to jump off of there right before the public comment uh, period started, but. It was interesting. I mean, what's your what's your thought on it right now? Or are you still trying to process all the uh, all the information? It's a lot of it's a lot of information to process. Um, my biggest concern was more about the uh, that two week closure yep. that they wanted to implement on us. Um, honestly, if they did implement it, like that first two weeks of March wouldn't bother anything. But for me, just as a conservation wise, I think it's going to affect a lot of the charter captains if they do it somewhere like April. You know, somewhere where the big yeah. time, you know, where those guys get to uh, make a good majority of their money. Um, I honestly don't think think closing two weeks of the spawning period is going to help anything at all. Uh, right. I wanted to voice my opinion. Like we just ran out of time. I couldn't jump on to comment. But like I, for me, it would have been like, I mean, if we would just take if they would take the majority of whatever funds they have and implement it more on like maybe hiring more conservation uh, COs. You know, yeah. for poaching wise, I think a majority of our smaller bass and, small, and some of that is it's lost due to that. Like, I mean, most New Jersey recreational anglers are very you know conservationists. They know how to handle fish and stuff like that. They're, yeah, there are the few ones out there that don't. But but that's where, you know, your podcast, your stream, my podcast comes in and we try to you know edu educate these um, other anglers on proper releases. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I guess I had similar things. I actually had my hand up to ask a question. Um, I wanted to get a question in and I was running out of time, so I had to put my hand down. But, uh, you know, my big thing is they're, they keep asking for, well, we could do it faster if you just let the board decide what to do. And we cut out the public comment and all of that stuff. So I, my question was just going to be, could you just go through with all of us exactly who's on the board and how they got there? Mm -hmm. uh, before we before we grant them all these powers for the 2022 assessment um didn't get to say it though because i would have missed the start of this but it wouldn't have mattered uh there's definitely a split group in that um in that meeting so i don't know i don't know what to think right now I, there's a lot to process there was a lot of data there was a lot of uh presentation of facts that were actually not facts and they said well we can't prove it but we think it yeah, um, there, were, there was a lot of that. And then, you know, Jim Hutchinson had some pretty good concerns early in the meeting about, you know, who's voting for closing spawning areas and things like that. Is it Pennsylvania people like me? Mm -hmm. who, or, or is it like New York impacted? people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. New York or is it people? New York, New York, Virginia people voting for like something that doesn't impact them? Yeah. And, and apparently the Virginia people don't like New Jersey. So yeah, wouldn't be shocked if some of those hundred and some people or approximately a hundred people in there were, were coming in from Virginia or another state just to mess with New Jersey. But anyway, well, that's a whole, a whole different stream. So, um, yeah. we we'll, we'll dive into this one. So, uh, just want to say hi, McCarmon's in there participation trophy. Ed's there. So Ed's night off. He still couldn't stay away. 
Uh, so Captain Hanks in the chat and James Flynn in there. Welcome, guys. Uh, nice to have you here. Tonight is a really cool one. Um, and it's something that I, I'm really excited about because uh, I, I really want to be more effective at, at sheep's head fishing and had a difficult time last year, although most of that was because of the weather and the days that I could go. It just didn't it just didn't line up with a good day to, to go for sheep, uh, whether it was ripping winds and not wanting to get up on the structure or, you know, <coughs> storms and everything like that. So I didn't do as nearly as much sheep's head fishing as I had hoped. However, I wanted to go to your seminar in Atlantic City Boat Show, uh, the full seminar, and I couldn't make it. And I know a lot of people couldn't make it. And for those that are unaware, Qua had a uh, pretty much capacity crowd for his seminar on sheep's head. And he, uh, we were talking about it and he said, you know what, why don't I come on to the live stream and do it live for, uh, the people for this channel. And man, me and, and Ed were, were all for it. We said, yep, absolutely. So Ed said, and I'm taking off. So <laughs> he went fishing today and slayed the stripers. Yeah, it's uh, all. And, and that's, and that brings us here. So, so Qua, um, why don't we step right into it? You know, instead of, instead of waiting around, uh, let's, let's jump right in. Did you want to start right away? Do you think about, uh, a few more guys would want to join in later? Or you just I mean, want to we, go Hey, if you want to talk about a couple of things beforehand, we could do that. Um, you know, it'll usually pick up in a few minutes. Um, you know, we, we've got a few people in here already. Um, we should get a bunch jumping in in a little bit though. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, like this, like you said, the only reason I wanted to do this was because the fact that like it, you know, it was just my first one. Um, and the fact that it was on a Thursday, so a lot of guys were at work and I was getting a lot of messages and a lot of like texts like that, like, Oh, wish we could make it, you know, it's one of those things. And I was just like, I feel bad. I mean, it filled, I mean, I filled every single chair and I had a couple of standing guys and there were a lot of people very interested. And then the, at the end of the seminar, I had a lot more people come up and talk to me, you know, by the stage and also by the, the fisherman magazine booth, and you know the rfa and stuff like that and i talked a little more so there's a lot of interest in sheep said you know in our state as a whole so i figured why not take the opportunity to try to you know put this podcast online i mean the only thing you don't you won't see is me running around the stage and like <laughs> prancing around using my pointers and pointing at things and like a rod demonstration of you know how to efficiently you know fish a piling or something like that but i mean we'll do the best we can yeah, I mean, you you could jump up and jump around on the couch and pretend that you're fishing a piling. We'll just laugh. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not doing all that. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, yeah, so, uh, man, I, I am looking forward to this. I was one of those that couldn't get down, especially on a Thursday. I couldn't get out of work. Uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm hoping that this year I'll be able to spend more time looking for the sheep's head. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to find you down there and just jump on your boat, whether you want me there or not. I'm oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. We're gonna we're gonna get that done. We're gonna get that done this year. Well, um, I'll, I'll jump on, and once you feel that boat just tip to the side, you know I'm sitting on the back trying to hide by the engine. Oh, trust me, I've had a couple of big guys. Have <laughs> you ever met the Wakefield? You ever met met the Wakefield boys? You'll know. Yeah, uh, they're they're some big tall guys, and yeah, uh, they they've, they've yeah. been fine on my boat. So yeah. as long as those boys are on, you know, you and me will be perfectly fine. Perfect. I mean, also another couple of things I always get is uh, I always get questioned about my seminars more like, like, why do you, why you're trying to protect the species and be conservationist and stuff like that, but you're teaching seminars to people how you, how you catch them. And my answer has always been education for anglers. It's always got to be free and you've got to always be willing to educate people. Yes, I may teach you how to target them, um, you know, structures, bait, all that good stuff but at the same time i'm using this platform also to practice conservation there's a big section in my all my seminars that i practice conservations teach conservation everything from releasing it to reviving them and also for the fact that there's rewards for you know great anglers that do release big fish so i mean it's it's, yeah. it's my outlet my, it's the only way for me to actually be able to preach it without you know, offending anyone, like publicly walking up to them and telling them. Yeah. I, look, I, I'm kind of in the same position. You know, there are people that, uh, you know, let's talk about weak fish. I'm really big on weak fish conservation or preservation at this point. Yep. Um, 
but I'll still tell people how to catch them. I'll just trust that they'll be releasing them and letting mm-hmm. them go for the most part. And most people do uh, without yeah. having to. They Most people just do, and they only keep the ones that, that aren't going to make it anyway. Um, so I, I, I'm really looking forward to that part of, of your presentation where you start talking about the, the conservation efforts. Um, it'll be really cool to see what some of the people in New Jersey are getting back this year in recognition for the releases that they have. Yeah. And I hope to be on that list, you know, hopefully, I mean, there's a chance, man, that there, there's not too many States that are catching big fish. Luckily in New Jersey, a lot of our fish are big. Yeah. Like the small, like, you know, they're talking about North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, they get fish, but they don't get fish over 20 inches. Not a lot. Right. For us, it's, you know, we get a more abundant numbers of them. So, if you can get five entries a month, that's five times the odds of winning a two, three hundred dollar giveaway prize spot from the uh, the program. So, right, right. I mean, just just before we even start, just just an idea. My, a month of February, we only had five sheepshead entry. You know, five. If you would have caught three over twenty and released and then int- entered it, you had three times more likely chance of beating those five guys out. <laughs> right. So. Right. Well, ho- hopefully I can get in there mainly, mainly just because that will mean that I'm catching at least one nice sheep's head, mm-hmm. uh, th- this summer. And, uh, I- I'm looking forward to it. I-, I love those types of programs. I, and personally, I don't, you know, I, I don't care if I win or, or not. Um, but I would like to see some of the pictures of the people that, that watch this channel, listen to your podcast, listen to our pa- podcast and, and just, you know, sharing some of those pictures of the releases, whether they win or not, doesn't matter. Yep. It's just the fact that you caught them and you let them go. Um, exactly. And they're pretty hardy fish too. Oh, they are. They are super hard. I've, I just actually, I found a photo earlier of a guy that caught one literally had a spear through him, a hole about the size of a golf ball. <laughs> and then he had a, sh- a shark or something bite half his fins and spines off the back. So he looked like a moon. This, this sheep's head wow. looked like a moon, but he still fed on somebody's jig and the guy still caught him. And I, I hopefully the guy let him go because I mean, he wasn't big. He was only yeah. like two, three pounds, but he looked like he's a survivor. And I was like, I really hope this guy let him go. This fish was a survivor. He deserved to live. Oh yeah. He earned it by that point. You yeah. Gotta, definitely. You gotta let him go back and swim around. Plus yep. you'll, be, you'll know if you ever catch the same one again, you don't even have to tag it. No, definitely not. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. So um, for those that, that aren't aware, uh, we do have some people that weren't watching this last summer. Uh, Kwa is one of the co-hosts of the Tide Chasers podcast, and it is an outstanding podcast. It's one of the very few that I actually subscribe to and I listen to every week. Now, I don't always get through the entire episode, though, Kwa. It depends on how much I, I'm, I'm working out that week. Yeah. <laughs> So if, I, if I'm having a lazy week, I get through, you know, because there are some really in-depth uh, good interviews on there. Um, but, man, it, great guests. And it has a local flair to it. It's not all local, uh, but it, but there is a local flavor to it. And it hits on fresh and salt water and just people that you really should know about if you're interested in fishing. You know, even if it's just for interest. You know, I've, I've, I've listened to episodes where I don't do that type of fishing and don't plan. But love the episodes. Love love hearing from these people. Yeah, most definitely. Like I see a couple of our even a couple of our guests that's been on the podcast. You got Eric in there. Yep. You've been on there. You know, a couple of other guys in here too. So I mean, they're gonna they're gonna be chiming in. And I mean, our goal for our Tai Chi podcast has always been just to connect listeners and anglers to all like with like minded ideas and just connect you guys so you guys become a better angler and also certain species you've never targeted you'll be able to get on a podcast and just kind of get a rough idea of where to start instead of just jumping in blind right it's it's just a great (laughs) podcast i recommend people check it out ed captain hanks tackle is is mentioning in the chat he listens to it to and from work i will tell you this sometimes he calls me when he's on his way home from work because obviously he's done listening and we actually talk about your podcast quite often and the topics and the people so um I, I, I really enjoy them. So hopefully people go over there and check it out. And it's, it's available literally everywhere um, on what is it? It's Apple, Apple Google, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Deezer, Stitcher, any, pretty much any of those. And also we, we work with Waypoint TV too. So we're, on, we're also on their podcast collection. So Yeah. So people should go over and, uh, and check that out. Definitely highly recommended. Won't be disappointed. You've had some great, great guests on there. Um, you know, you mentioned 
you mentioned Eric. Eric's one that uh, at some point I'd like to talk to. <laughs> I mean, that guy is just. He's fishy. He's super <laughs> fishy. He is. He is. He's another. We, we have another guy who's coming on. He's actually on Captain Hank's uh, pro team. And uh, it's funny because there are just certain people that you know wherever they are, there's going to be fish there and they're going to be caught. And maybe not by you, but by them. Yeah. And, you know, this guy, Mike, Michael Warner, is one of them. And, and Eric is definitely one of them. So, um, you know, another guy I wouldn't mind just finding out on the water sometime. <laughs> but great guest. So, yeah. So do you want to jump in and yeah. uh, and start going through this? Yeah, and, let's do this. Uh, and, I'm and all set. As you're opening that up, guys, this is going to be interactive. So just jump in with any questions, comments, or feel free to talk amongst yourselves in the chat, whatever you want to do. This yep. is wide open for you tonight. All right. So we're going to take this over. Now, how do we switch? Are we switching this over to the big screen? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I got it for you. <coughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right, guys. Once again, welcome to my Sheep's Head uh, seminar. Um, with most of us, I would assume, are from New South Jersey or fish in South Jersey. So you know what South Jersey is fam famous for, right? It's going to be pork rolls, tomatoes, and I guess sheep's head now. They've become pretty popular. Now, are they the staple of South Jersey? I wouldn't say so, but they're getting there. So um, pretty much this is going to be my beginning of my podcast. Thank you guys for joining. For those that missed the AC show, I'm bringing it, bringing it to you live here on uh, Fat Dad's Fishing Seminar. So go ahead and join in. And I'll break the I'll break down every slide as we're working through. If you guys have any questions, you're more free to uh, comment in the section. And Rich is going to do a fantastic job over there, coordinate everything together. All right, all right. So first two photos are going to be a couple of nice sheep that we put into my boat last season. These are the Wakefield boys. If you ever heard of them or seen them on Instagram, uh, I took them out two separate days, uh, and we had a phenomenal day. I mean, it wasn't crazy. You know, each of them had about two, three fish a piece, averaging anywhere between five and six pounds. Um, but it, it was a good bite. All right, quick introduction. Uh, so I started fishing in South Jersey around 2015. Um, that's when my whole sheep's head uh, mission began. Uh, I fished and I learned a lot about sheep's head. And I do give him all the credit from Captain Dan Schaefer of Insomnia Guides. He's been doing this for like 10, 15 years. So he knows his thing. Um, like I said, I, I started fishing with him since 2015 and then my obsession started. And from that day forward to now, we are really good friends. We talk all the time, talk tactics, talk pretty much anything we go. We give each other reports, what's been good, what's been bad, how's the tides been, stuff like that. So 90% of everything I learned, it's going to be from Captain Safer. So a lot of what you're going to hear today, is pretty much a refresh. If you ever attended one of his sheep set seminars, it's going to be pretty close to that. And then add on whatever I've learned throughout the years. Um, most days I'm usually striper fishing on the flats, on the marshes. And then in between those running from marshes and flats is when I sheep's head fish, when that window opens up, yeah, sheep's head so windows. Mm -hmm. while, real, real quick. The, your screen is, is not showing. It showed for mine for a moment. And then I just got, well, actually Ed came out of uh vacation day and jumped in. Okay. But you know, it's not displaying across all devices. Um, uh, if you want to shoot over an email to me real quick, I can try to load that in there all right let's see you want me to shoot you an, e an email yeah i mean you know i could put it in the powerpoint or something real quick and do my work behind the scenes while you talk about sheep's head all right hold on what do you want me to send you anyway do you have do you have the presentation or it's in uh what is it in which one? Wait, so you, you need me to re-upload to send the slides? Yeah, yeah, they can't see it. All right, hold on one minute. Let me see if I could try sharing it one more time. Or you can oh. share your screen. Let's see. You know, it's funny. No matter what, um, no matter what you do ahead of time, Quad and I actually went over this earlier this week and everything was working perfectly. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Let me show this on my screen. Let's see. Yeah, you want to share your screen? How do I do that? You should be able under the share at the bottom. Let's see. Share screen. Let's see if it works. 
I think we tried this last time. It didn't work. Email me the link and I'll share my screen. No. I mean, I'm already uploading. There. Well, I just uploaded the second one. Is that working? Let me remove this one. All right. It's... Yeah, that, that one I can see. All right. Well, this is the. I just removed the other one. So we'll put this one up. There you go. All right. Let's go back to that. Now, confirm everyone can see us. See the screen? Can, I'm confirming I can see it on two different computers. You're good. All right, cool. All right, so we're going to go back to uh, – so most days, um, either fly fishing or spin fishing for stripers and bass on the marshes or the flats. Um, and But in between those runs from the the, mass, the marshes and the flats, it's usually when I'm targeting sheep's head through those windows. So it's kind of flats, sheep's head, flats. That's usually my schedule. That's usually how I do it. Um, now I founded my podcast, uh, me and, me and Dan founded the podcast in 2021. The only reason we, we figured a podcast would work is we listened to a few down South. Uh, I have a couple in New York, but we had nothing local. So my, my idea was to come up with something, a podcast that has to deal with a lot of lo our local area, local anglers, every, you know, just cause we just don't have it here. So I figured that's where we started it. Uh, didn't think of much of it, but you know what? In the past year, it pretty much blew up, and now it's super popular around a lot of guys, and uh, we love it. You know, we just love the energy you guys bring to us when you guys see us out in our streets and talk to us. I see you guys at shows. You know, it's it makes me feel better that everyone's learning a little bit something out of everything. All right, so we're gonna move on. All right, so the way I run this discussion is uh, just like the seminar. It's an open discussion. If you guys have a question. Feel free to uh, ask it in the comments. Uh, Rich is going to put them all together, and when we get a chance, we'll take a break. We're going to start answering all of them. Um, well, this is – I can't see your hands, so we're going to forget the second one about raising your hands. And uh, if you have any super detailed questions, uh, you can either wait till after the presentation, or you can – we'll chat about it a little bit later after the, after the whole presentation is over. So, like I said, open, open discussion, guys. Feel free to ask any questions. The only question I will not answer is spots. Besides that, everything else is good to go. Here we go. All right. Uh, so as for locations of sheep's head, they range anywhere from Brazil up to Maine. Um, I, we've seen the furthest I've seen them or heard of them caught in the last two years. Furthest one I've seen caught was the last is Connecticut. That's the last reported one. Furthest one we've seen, ever seen further up that way. Now, majority of the concentration uh, of sheep's head are in Florida you know, through the panhandle through the space coast, through the nature coast. Um, they are down there for us down there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a native down there. So sheep's head to us are down there are very nuisance. They don't get ginormous. They get to about half pound, a pound, um, maybe two, two, three pounds inshore if you find them. The bigger ones don't come in till winter. But like I said, it's, it's kind of a rare thing. Um, but they are down there. And then lately, uh, Louisiana's had a really good influx in them. And so has Mississippi. So have you ever seen those Texas pictures, those guys out there, they put 50 to 60 on the boat, you know, those kill shots in the deck. They have the numbers, you know what I mean? And, and, and I'll talk about this later about why, why they have the numbers. And then and my projected future, hopefully New Jersey, we get those same numbers, you know, with the way things are going. Um, now, larger specimens have been reported starting from Virginia, especially the uh, CBBT bridge. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's the uh, Chesapeake Bay Bridge that connects the eastern shore to Virginia. It's about, I think it's, I don't know how long it is, maybe 21 miles or something like that. But the largest specimens start from there. Like I had a couple of guys on a podcast that spearfished that area, and they've seen 20 pounders. Okay, it's not it's not reg it's regular down there for the guys to, to pull up 15, 16 pounders. Now it's a very hard bridge to fish if you never fished it, but if you put the time and you know what you're doing, I guarantee you there are some bridge monsters down there. So, I mean, from there, then we move up, up the coast, um, all the way up to uh, Shark River Inlet. They, I mean, I mean we go all the way up. Indian River Inlet, Shark River, they, we move, the sheep's head move all the way up to New York. Um, and then I'll get into the next section. They get into New York, and because that's where sheep's head bay's name came from. Because originally back in the 1800s, Sheep's heads were very popular in Sheep's Head Bay, hence the name, you know, Sheep's Head Bay. That's how it got it. So, so Sheep's Head's been up here for a very long time. 
where they have moved or migrated, we don't know. Um, as far as sheep said, New Jersey, they've been here 20 plus years, guys. They've been here forever. Um, numbers wise, we don't know. As long as far as I know, Schaefer's been catching them for 15 years. And he says that he's talked to people and they've always been here. Just like Redfish. You know, Redfish, um, Staffmere used to be what the Redfish Capital were. I remember what they were saying. You know, we had bull reds up here up to 40 pounds. And they slowly disappeared because we lost eelgrass due to storms and stuff like that. You know, it's just the the food source for the redfish and stuff like that just never happened. Um, and the redfish were, up, were always up here with them. Um, now, as for the Jersey State record, it is 19.3 pounds. Wasn't caught very far from Atlantic City. It's right back in there in Longport. Like, I know that exact location where this one was caught but i'm not gonna expose it but it wasn't far it wasn't far okay it's 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 there and the story behind it's crazy i'm probably going to try to get that guest on one day just to try to tell you that story um but the previous record i believe was 16.3 pounds and that one's caught way up north in mana off manahawken bridge okay so that's deep in the back deep in the back bays of Manahawk, like way back there. So you, that tells you the story that sheeps had do travel further away from the inlets. So, I mean, they could be anywhere. Um, the world record sheep said was in Louisiana in uh, 1982, 21.4 pounds. I, I believe that measured at like 31, almost 30, 31 inches. So it was a big fish. All right. So last year, um, a lot of you guys probably saw the pictures. Uh, we had a good fisherman now, South Jersey. He caught a potential record breaker, so we thought. So, you know, we we saw the post. We got, you know, we we heard him. He said we had a potential great record breaker. So he caught the fish. Incredible fisherman, this man. So he didn't want to kill the fish because he's a super conservationist too. So he put the fish in his live well, turned the live well on, traveled all the way into our favorite tech shop down there, you know, tight lines, got it weighed in. Uh, because it was bouncing around on his boga like 18, 19. He couldn't get a like really good measurement on it. So took it all the way to tight lines and weighed it in. Uh, it was only 17, three, uh, broke all our hearts, but at the same time, it was, it was in a tremendous fish. Um, and here's the photo of that fish. Now, there you go. That's Jesse. Incredible fish, 17.3 pounds. Um, he pulled it out of the live well, got it up to the weight, the, the, the weigh station weighed in at 17.3. A couple quick measurements. Um, and you know what? She was safely released back into the uh, back into the wild, right there, right at the dock. We let her go. Um, revived there. She swam off powerful. I mean, the bigger they get, the uglier they get. Now, you can see her tail. It's, it's you know, it's beat. Her spine's already beat up. I mean, the, I mean, we probably could age this fish anywhere about for her size, about 20 years old, 20 plus. So, I mean, they do grow slow, but give and take, I think if you, if she survives two more seasons here, she may get up to that 19 pound mark. And I think she will. That's so, a big fish. Yeah, that's it's a big crazy. fish. She was, she was caught in the back. So yeah. that's, that's, we have big fish back here and I, we've broken off, like I've broken off multiple fishes in the 15, 16 pound range. You know, it's, they're, they're back there. It's just time, patience, and you'll be able to find them. Um, all right, next. All right. Uh, do we have any questions, Rich? Do we want to answer? So the, the questions so far are really going to be more around, um, just general things. Um, you know, just comments about how you set the hook and things like that, but that's okay. more to come. Yeah, um, we'll get to that. And then the, the one question was, uh, how far North in the Bay can sheep's head be caught? Let me put it up on the screen so you can see it. That's from Will. Okay. How far north of the bay can she say be caught? Um, so, as I explained earlier, our last previous New Jersey state record was caught by the uh, the Manahawken Bridge. Now, you know how far up you are from the Toms River area, so, and you know, Barnegat Manahawken. So, you know where the Manahawken Bridge is. So, that's pretty far up the river. Um, they do they do make it up that far as as far as and also I'm, We've had I, I had a couple of guys report to send me pictures. They caught some in uh, Raritan. Yeah. So I mean they yeah. they move they move everywhere. If they have the right time and area to move, they will. Uh, majority of them do like to stick by the inlet because they like to run in and out all the time. 
but they do make their ways up the bay and we do have a breeding stock i believe of them here um now do they breathe offshore or do they breathe inshore we don't know um but i have pictures and confirmations that they do breed here because we be catching uh what we found uh like maybe one inch one and a half inch sheep's head in minnow pots in minnow traps they go they crawl in there and they get stuck some of my cast guys cast net for like mullet and stuff and be pulling up one and a half inch babies so and i i doubt this, that size one inch they'll be able to migrate that whole thing that whole yeah. migration from south to north you know so they definitely breed here now where or how i don't know um i've tagged them uh haven't really gotten any tags back so that's where we go from there all right so as we go into the next section uh season now when do we start targeting for sheep's head um from past experiences talking for separate captains other anglers myself um may is usually a good time to start thinking about them because once you see that first black drum come in is when uh it's usually when we think that they migrate with the black drum they make that move through the great you know through uh delaware bay and they make their way into our waters um um, people always kind of mistaken uh, sheep's head and puppy drum. Now, big drums you can definitely tell because their their stripes are disappeared. You don't really notice them anymore. But puppy drums, if you ever seen a puppy drum, looks almost like a sheep's head because they have that really dark seven like five bars, and then sheep's head are have that same five six bars. So they get a lot of mistaken for them. But uh, you can always tell by the the body. Their sheep's head are super round. Uh, and puppy drums are more longer and flat, kind of like croaker size looking. And they always have those little whispers in the front too. So like, again, they start migrating with the black drum coming somewhere around May. Uh, we've caught them as early as the first week of May. And that's, I mean, but we've had a super warm winter when that year happened. So first week of May, second week of May, the drum showed up. We went out. It wasn't a sleigh fest. I mean, we worked hard eight, 10 hours put in maybe two fish in the boat. But, I mean, we've caught them as early as May. Uh, sheep's head season runs anywhere from May, or the first time you find them, all the way up until November. Now, I stopped fishing for them in September due to the fact that striper season, stripe, the fall run starts. So I drop everything I do and just start going striper fishing. So I'm turning on that. But I've had guys, anglers, catching them in uh, September. October is a really good month to target them. Uh, November and then um, I've had a few catch them in December and a couple have sent me photos of sheep's head roaming around pilings and stuff in January in like 35 40 degree water so I mean I don't fish for them that late so I don't know how active they are but they I've they've been I've we've targeted them up to November so give and take safest to say May to November is the best season to uh is is when the season starts uh, I've always just found and that July has always been a super slow month for us targeting sheep said we don't know why um my theory is the water's just way too hot and they just they just don't like it um so I um, mean yeah I've always had super slow season we'll pick one or two a week but like that's about it it's not it's nothing to brag about but like it's July has always been a hot month for all of us and it's been I mean it's pretty much almost like our summer doldrum right rich we just really yeah. don't have any. Yeah. And I, I have my theories. Um, let me just bring this up because it, it needs to be addressed. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to explain this one so people don't think. <laughs> All right, guys. This uh, Bobby Norgard is one of my co-hosts on Ty Chaser's <laughs> podcast. He <laughs> likes coming in everywhere and just busting my bubbles. He, he, if he could, he would stand in front of their seminar and just hold signs that says, don't listen to this guy. But he's one of my incredible <laughs> friends. Uh, you'll see his photo a little bit later holding a sheep's head. He's yeah. in there. Yeah, I I just had to put that up there because as soon as I saw it, I, I was trying not to laugh because you you obviously weren't looking at the comment with me. Oh, I saw uh, but, I saw I saw him sneak in. I was just did. like, yeah. Okay. Um, now to to your comment, the doldrums of July. My theory is, I mean, and it's not. I, I guess it's not really a theory. It's it's true when you have the warmer water and. If the water's not moving as much, you're going to end up getting less oxygen in that water, which tends to depress the feeding habits of many species. Um, now, it doesn't mean you can't catch them, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I was fishing down in the Outer Banks in July of last year. The water was 94 degrees. And I'm catching specks, I'm catching reds, I'm catching flounder. I didn't go for sheep's head, believe it or not. I didn't go for sheep's head uh, just because the inlet conditions weren't good and, and I was right at the bridge. But um, that that's my theory. I think it, it naturally slows down once that water gets that hot. Um, and it's a, it's a dramatic change in water temperature as well because the difference yep. between July and and June is, I mean, it's a huge swing in temperature. You know, that's yeah. where you start getting the 80 plus degree water in July. Yeah. My, my only best advice for those is fish early. And if you catch a good incoming tide with that early morning, the water's cooler, you might stand a better chance of finding one. Um, yeah. So best months to target cheap set are actually August and September, right around that cooling period. So as soon as our temperatures start dropping is when the cooling period starts. And that's when they start schooling together. You know, the other few months are like you're, you're picking random fish, right? You're picking random fish here and there. But when you get into August, September is the time when they start schooling. I mean, they're not ginormous schools. Uh, I've seen them schooled in 10s, 15s. But I've also ran into, yeah, so I've also ran into schools of 50. And that's, I, I only know that because I see it on my fish finder. You know, I'll cruise with my side scans and I'll usually see them hanging there. And then there'll be like an incredible school. And it, it's just like the one day we did see it, uh, me and my buddy Johnny stopped in there. And uh, it's a short window though. For some reason, it's weird. They were there. We dropped down. 45 minute window. We banged out 13 fish. Three of them were, o three of them were over, uh, over 10 pounds. It was like two 11s and a 12 in 45 minutes and after that the die just went flat the bite just flattened out stopped they they were there they were still on the the the, the graph but they weren't feeding and we threw everything down there too so it was just like hey 45 minutes dinner bell guys real quick little feed and then that's it it was over well they saw their big brothers getting pulled out by their lip too they're like Wait, yeah hold on a second <laughs> all right cool so uh yeah so um as for some of our guesses about their winter migrations, uh, we actually think they migrate in two different patterns. Um, they do migrate the north to south. You know, I'm assuming wintertime is when they head out here out of our waters and head through the Delaware Bay, back a little bit further south to find a little bit warmer water. And I also think that they travel from west to east, so they go offshore. Maybe not super far, maybe five, ten miles. Um, like I've I haven't had any guys report to me that people have caught sheep off the wrecks off of South Jersey, but I've had confirmation that Captain Schaefer has talked to me. He's gone out um, buoy hopping, looking for fish, and he's he's seen a few sheep literally ten miles offshore, just kind of feeding on off crab buoys and stuff like that. So we know that they do travel out that far, but you know, for winter wise, I think they do maybe move out there for their migrations. All right. Let's see. Moving on. All right. <clears throat> so structure. This is very important when it comes to sheep's head fishing. Um, you know, structure is the number one thing that they look for. They're just, they're, they're, I would say they're like tog, but they're not. And we'll get to that. Why not? Now they love rocky bottoms. Uh, they love place structure. So you talk about artificial structure, like sunken boats, uh, timber logs, or you know, artificial wrecks, natural wrecks uh, from experience. Most of our area in South Jersey is, it's a kind of a plateau-ish kind of beach. It goes out and it's very, it gradually gets deeper, but not like, you know, North Jersey, you get off a mile off the beach, it's 60, 70, 80 feet. You know, a mile off of like uh, Stone Harbor is probably 20 feet, 25 at max. Uh, so 30, 40 feet, would the, I would say will be the, the safest if you're going to try to target them offshore. Um I know a couple guys up north Jersey that caught them in about yeah 40 45 feet of water off wrecks. Um, it's like it's one of those things that you can't really specifically target them. It's just gonna be randomly you'll catch them by tall fishing. Um, as and as for jetties, they're they're always on the jetties. Um, now, is there a way to target them specifically off the jetties? I'm I'm gonna say no. And any fisherman out there that says that they have them specifically dialed in as a jetty fisherman that. You know, I'm going to say no. It's not possible. You you can't dial sheep's head in off a jetty here in New Jersey because you're going to have to fight through the Bergals, the Tog, 
the short tog, you know, and every little other thing that's sitting between those rocks. I know a couple of guys up, you know, up by up in North Jersey that, you know, like Barnegat and, and Manasquan and those kind of jetties, they've caught them um, while tog fishing. So, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's like, it's how do you specifically target sheep off of jetty when there's so many other fish around that's going to be pecking off all your bait? Yeah, I, I can tell you I've caught them. Um, uh, every sheep's head I've ever caught was by accident and it was always near a jetty. Um, yeah. And I've never caught more than one in, in a, in a session either. You know, it was always mm -hmm. a great day tog fishing and something grabbed it on the way down, you know, and that yep. was, the, that was the sheep. Um, but, but yeah. you also, it, those were also very deep jetties, like right mm -hmm. on severe drop-offs, you know, like yep. you get in some of these inlets. Um, yeah, I l look, I'm not the expert on sheep's head. I would not be targeting. I would not be jetty fishing, uh, as a first choice, but that, that actually, actually we have a question on this, but let's go through the rest of these. And then we do have a question on this slide afterwards. Yep. Cool. We'll, we'll hit that. So yeah, as yeah, once again, as for jetties, um, I have a couple guys up north that are really, that have been having luck targeting off the jetties um, on a good season. They'll probably have, they get about seven, eight fish and that's a really good season for them. And that it's always just randomly. They always say it's randomly while they're, while they're tall fishing. So, I mean, and like one of my buddy, Jeff, uh, Jetty Jeff up Barnegat light. He loves fishing Barnegat light. He gets a good five, six fish a year, but it's always just random, you know, just randomly taught while tog fishing. So, uh, now the next set is one of my favorites. It's going to be piling piers and docks. So like I said, Jersey's filled with them. The, the advice I give best with those always look for pilings, piers and docks that have the most growth. Now, if that dock looks like it's about to fall apart and it has so much barnacles on it, that's the one you're going to be looking for. You know, that's the one that had, that's been established. They've, They've been there for a very long time. Um, here's a little secret. I'm not, I didn't do this at the seminar, but if you guys check these docks, these pilings during low tide, you're going to look on the on the pilings. You're going to see missing chunks out of it. It's missing chunks with white marks. That's where sheep have been feeding. So if you ever if you ever paddle by or you walk by and you see a piling that has like little chunks missing off of it, it's 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 missing like a hole, but there's like a little, like a little white spot right there. The sheep's been feeding there. That's how you know they's, they've been there. So that's kind of like an inside secret to just to let you guys know out there. So um, also next up, we got mussel beds and sod banks. Now this fishery is still new. Um, it's, it's hard to, it's harder to do this fishery, but they're there. There's a certain time and season for it. And I've yet to dial in specifically, but randomly I've found them. Uh, but if you can find mussel beds or, oyster beds or side banks and we're getting to the details of these specific structures as we're getting we're going through the slides um and bridges now jersey all the way up and down jersey we got bridges everywhere right so some bridges hold them some bridges don't my best bet is do your homework and start exploring little uh all the bridges you can there's special there's special ways to fish these bridges and i'll go through them um this is the best bet for a angler that doesn't have access to a boat or a kayak is bridges try to find small bridges that doesn't have a lot of that has current but it's not enough current that it just rips so like i said you guys are from shore so you guys kind of handicap when it comes to sheep's head fishing but it's possible you know like that 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 um jersey state record fish was caught from land it wasn't caught from a boat or uh or a kayak yeah all right so well, all right, let's let's, uh, let's get to that question. Yeah. So here's here's the question for you: Is oh, there one kind Duncan. of structure favored more than another, like to hang on bridges more so than pilings or rock piles, etc.? All right. Well, that's a great question, Duncan. He's supposed to be hopping on my boat this season, so let's. Oh, yeah. So uh, they hang on. They do. They're. I, mean, I can't say they hang on more than others, but structurally, ninety percent of my fish are caught off of like pilings. No, whether it be bridge pilings or dock pilings for boats or just plain, simple pilings just sitting out in the middle of anywhere, you know, um, the, the only way to find out is you got to fish them and you got, and that gets into my next section a little bit later, how fast and how efficiently you should fish them. Like it, it's going to be like one of those things you don't focus on the same area too long. 
because they're fish, fish swim. So is that the last one for that section? It is. We, we okay. have some tackle ones coming up. But, All right, cool. You know, we'll Ta hold yeah. those. Tackle is coming up in a minute. All right, so these are the basic uh, types of structures. I don't have my pointer, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna pretty much show them out. The the that one big slide, big picture is a fishing pier, typical fishing pier. You probably see in Florida or something. We have smaller ones here, so um, yep, those fishing piers hold them. The other one is the uh, boat dock piers. They are they are on boat docks. You just gotta find a specific one with that right growth. And then the other ones I'm talking about is pilings that have just sit out in the middle of nowhere. So those are, you know, those are typically the ones sometimes mostly I find them at too, too. The, uh, like I said, look for barnacles, look for growth. That's all you're looking for. That's, if they're there, they'll let you know. All right. So next up, we got side banks, we got mussel beds, and then we have oyster beds. Um, I will, yeah, like I said, we'll get into it, how to fish these as we're making our way through. These are just examples. So we got rocky bottoms uh jetties and the artificial wrecks that get dropped off to build wrecks out here on our ocean fronts all right tides tides well, hold now on. before we go into that bobby's yeah. got a question now you can choose to answer this or not all right thoughts on 37 bridge going back to tom's river bad water clarity shallow in terms of depth pretty much exclusively pilings any thoughts you know i want to try it this year okay well the 37 bridge is correct it's super shallow water is very muddy um we're talking i think i think we i've talked to bobby about this i think the water by the 37 is only like five feet at max yeah um the it's possible i'm not saying that they're not there um because there's a bridge in our area that that i know that's it's super shallow um seven feet deep maybe max at high tide uh we've caught them off of there uh the water clarity there it's a, it's better than the 37 brick it's clear it's, it's green because it's it's so close to an inlet um but i'm not saying they can't because like we talked discussed earlier manahawken bridge they've made their way up that far and they've been caught off of that bridge so i wouldn't doubt that you won't be catching them back in the 37 bridge um uh, we'll find out this year when we drag my boat up to your house <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll do a little exploring up there when we get up time for you know in between in between our fall fall striper run you know I'll I'll I'll, I'll duck in the back and take a peek back there see what's back there now now there's you know in in regards to this spot or not specific spots but the types of spots down south um, when I was fishing flats in North Carolina mm -hmm. you would see sheep's head just flying through mm -hmm. um, and I think. You know, we don't fish flats as much up here, but, you know, to, to Bobby's point, there is a bridge that Ed and I have talked about numerous times that we have fished near, but we haven't fished because it's only about three feet deep. But boy, does it have a lot of growth on it. Um, mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I'm going to be trying that this year. I mean, the only reason we didn't last year is because it was uh, it didn't match up with the tides. I mean, it gets really low there at low tide, yeah. so we, we couldn't even in our kayaks we didn't want to go back um but we're going to be giving it a try this year <laughs> we'll see if it translates up here but but i know that you i i have seen them on the flats up here too yeah um but but they're always cruising yeah um, that's because that's what that's their highway to get from you yeah. know certain structures to uh, people don't realize sheep they don't move a lot but when they feel that the food in that area is diminished or they don't have enough they move on to another area and they use the channels and the flats to get through because it's a shortcut and also they can pick off like blue crabs yeah. you know grass and you know, shrimp and stuff like that as they're making the way through because people don't realize our marshes back in south jersey are very rich with food like all kinds yes. of stuff in there and that's you know that's why we have such a solid back bay marsh kind of flats kind of fishery compared to like north jersey when it's kind of like you know kind of just not not much going on in the back so full agreement yeah <coughs> all right so next up we're coming up to tides and weather now tides and weathers tides is going all can be depending on your area some plate areas are better tides than others some love incoming some out, outgoing um for our area and that's me specifically starting from cape may up to i would say ac that's my area in a stretch. That's all I fish, that whole stretch of area. Um, 
I've always found the the last two hours of incoming, and you fish all the way through the outgoing. Um, that's always the that's always that's a big generic window, but there are window when you figure them out. Sheep said they're patternable about three to four days, and then when the when something changes in the the temperature of the water, it changes them again. So when you think you have them figured out, you don't because if they flip around, they do the complete opposite. And I found that multiple times this year. It's it drives you nuts, but that's that's how it's always been. Um, sheep said love moving water, so that's that's what I know for the kayak kayak guys like Rich. Moving water sucks for you guys. Hate it. You know, but for me, uh, moving water, what happens is you think, think about it. The more current that runs through, the more compressed these fishes are. Because they don't, they're just like every other fish, they're predators. They don't want to fight current. So what they do is they sit behind these eddies, behind certain pilings, side banks, chunks, whatever it may be. They sit behind them and let the bait float around them. And they literally just pick them off. And especially the same thing with like crabs and stuff like that. When they're on a piling... They don't want to be on the front side of that piling because that current is going to be pushing them. They have to exert more force just to hang on. So what they do is the crabs, they usually crawl through the back side of the pilings just to duck out of the current. <clears throat> so moving tides are always best. Um, high tides are always good because sheep's head, a lot of mistakes that fish, uh, fishermen make when sheep's head fishing is the fact that they think they're like tog. Um, they drop straight to the bottom, 30 feet. They sit there, they wait, and they hold. And you're not going to catch anything down there but tog and oyster crackers and all those, you know, those junk fish that we don't want to get into. Sheep's head, believe it or not, feed in the first 15 feet of the water column. Now, they will make their movement up and down through that water column, and that gets into the tactic about how, how to um, fish that spot a little bit later. Um, yeah, so as you're, as you're fishing these tides... Um, like I said, moving water is the best, incoming or outgoing, whichever tide you can get a good angle on you know, the certain areas. But the eddies, eddy is the key word, eddies. You want to find area that has calm water because that's usually where they're going to kind of bundle up. And there'll be a couple, there's going to be a video I'm going to show up in a little bit, and Rich will play it for me, and then it will give you an idea of what I mean. Um, as for weather conditions, I've caught them in rainy weather. I caught them in snotty weather. I've caught them in bluebird skies. I've caught them in cloudy days. Uh, preference wise they don't really care they don't when they want to eat they're going to eat um the only thing i've ever noticed is the window opens a lot better when you see a cold front coming in i mean just like every other fish fluke stripers when they feel that very much pressure, pressure drop they're going to want to feed because they feel like they need to feed before the storm comes so that's that's the only difference i've felt in weather that they've actually turned on a lot more than usual that's, that's a great point. And I think a lot of people overlook that, you know, th you can, I mean, it's a fact that a lot of fish, not all fish, but a lot of fish will, will take advantage of that pre-storm fish, uh, or drop in, in, uh, in pressure. And it just triggers that feeding response, which is why you see a lot of people say, I got out right before the storm heading down right before the storm. You mm -hmm. know, it's not just the surfers that are heading out for the waves. It's a lot of fishermen because they take that as their best chance to get a easy feed before a storm rolls in and, and changes everything up, changes the, the normal currents and patterns. Um, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up in this. Yep. And, and it's interesting to me because I didn't know if they were that type of a, a, of a feeder. Yeah, they are. They're, they are opportunist, but at the same time, they, they are, they're like every other game fish. They feel like the cold storm is going to come through and then that can be able to find food. So they feed first, they feed as much and as quick as they can. Um, yeah, I see, I see James's uh, question real quick. Qua and his spot lock. Um, honestly, guys, spot lock. I found never to be for, 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 for areas with high current, like bridges and pilings and stuff like that. I've never had any luck with my spot lock and I do have it. Um, what happens is the current at these areas are so, change they change so much that your spot lock won't calibrate it quick enough and it'll throw you either off the boat or into a, a piling and it's happened to me multiple times and i've stopped using it now i still do use my trolling motor as i'll i'll, I'll come up downstream uh, down current i'll come up and i'll literally be going back and forth with my trolling motor um probably four or five feet away from that piling and trying to fish it but i see i get i have one of those um the little remotes that you hang on your wrist from Minkota. So it's kind of like 
you know, I'm fiddling it. It's, it's, it's something you got to practice. You got to be able to fiddle with it. And at the same time, you know, fish the piling, you'll get used to it, but like it's, you got to control it and fish at the same time. Yeah. I, um, I've seen guides out there and they're not, they're using the trolling motor, but they're, they're holding the bridge. They're not yeah. spot locking. Ever. Yeah. No, we, we, yeah, we are at most, if you're fishing with two people, one's going to fish and one's going to hold, hold a bridge or hold a piling while the other guy fish, you won't be able to fish, you know, two guys at the same time. It's almost impossible um because of the current that sits there it's just your your trolling motor won't be able to make that different yeah and let, let's also just mention um i'll just say this you don't tie off to the bridge yeah. if you're fishing a bridge i mean do it if you want but just know it's in new jersey it's illegal um and depending on where you are they're all way too happy uh, to call the police and if you're tied off you will get fined so just be cognizant of that plus it, it is dangerous um you know a boat rips through and you're tied off you're you have nowhere to go but back into the bridge pilings yeah and uh so just just be really careful about that yeah um as of now like the state police and the uh like the coast guard they they'll see us and they know what we're doing they know we're fishing um we, and we kind of like it like that they really don't say much they'll try drive by they'll check to make sure you're not tied off and if you're not they're 100 percent fine with you fishing it um, it's just the guys that do tile, what's going to happen is it's going to get bad enough that now they're going to start not letting any of us fish the bridges anymore. You know, just, just to save a lot of us fishermen and you guys too, is just try not to tie off. Don't set a bad example for other anglers because it only takes is one person to do it. And then the rest are going to start. And then what's going to happen is it's just, it's going to be a problem and it's going to affect all of us. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, before you move on, there's, yep. there's another one here for you. Okay. Do you notice a difference in depth where they feed depending on the structure? Uh, and Michael is saying that he has noticed that they are higher up around bridges and pilings and pretty much near the bottom of the sod banks. Michael, you are totally 100% correct. Depending on the structure of where they're located, bridges and pilings, yep, they'll be up in the upper 15, 20 feet max column. And we'll get into the specifics of how to fish those a little bit later. And also, and as, yeah, as for sod banks, yeah, they they usually are off the bottoms because what happens is, just like bridges and and um, pilings, these uh, sheep's they're not just wandering around all around side banks. They're they're usually tucked in behind broken chunks of side banks, like big chunks. They're like if you ever drive, you know, you've been in our marshes, you'll see them. Um, chunks of we lose chunks of side bank all the time, and usually what happens is the sheep and especially tog too. We get some really big tog back there that sit behind these big chunks of, of side bank because they don't want to fight. They don't want to fight current. They want an easy meal. So they sit behind there and they wait. So behind this big chunk of side bank, you'll find a sheep's head, a tog, and a striped bass sitting in the same spot waiting for whatever may f wash over the top of that side bank. You know, it'd be a crab, uh, broken mussels that just came off the side bank. It's going to get washed over or around that side bank. So what these guys are doing, they're sitting there. They're sitting there and they're waiting. And then I, I'm, that's when we get into the explanation, explanation about fishing sod banks a little bit in, a little bit later in here. And I'll kind of give you an idea of why they sit back there. Um, so as for the uh, water, I always look for clean green water. Always try to avoid dry, dirty, you know, low tides. Low, low dirty tides, it's one of those things like if I see it's low and it's dirty, I won't even fish it. It's just, it's, it's just, it will, you're going to waste your time doing it. You're better off, you know, finding holes in the back somewhere on the marshes looking for striped bass or something. Cause if the water's low, low and dirty, they're there, they want, they aren't there. All right. Cool. Let's see. All right. All right. So we're going to get into tackle guys, tackle, tackle, tackle. Very important when sheep's head fishing, this isn't going to be your typical, you know, uh, bottom rigs with the sinker on the bottom and a dropper loop. No, this is, this is a little bit more of a technique and tackle wise and specific rod wide, because it's the bite is very subtle. You're not going to see, you're not going to feel it. Some days you'll get that you'll feel it, but other days you won't. And I'll explain that in a couple of next slides. But so we're looking at, depending on what you're on, um, I'm on, I'm on a skiff, 15 foot skiff. So I'm using a seven foot medium to medium heavy rod rated anywhere between quarter ounce up to five eighths of an ounce is ideal um rods i have on the boat are going currently right now is going to be the uh, the century we uh, weapons junior uh seven foot that one is rated for a quarter ounce up to an ounce and a quarter 
And then my second rod is a uh, is it's a good entry rod for everybody that wants to get into it. It's a seven foot um, medium medium heavy. Actually, it's a medium heavy uh, tsunami carbon shield. The uh, the sea foam green one. That one's rated for quarter ounce up to one ounce. Uh, either those are perfect. Um, you can and for kayaks like rich and stuff. Um, you can go. You guys can scale down to a six six. So it, it gives you guys a little bit more uh, shorter length, easier to work these pilings. Uh, real size. Anybody are between 2,000 or 2,500 up to 3,000. Uh, perfect reels. Just make sure you set the drags right. They have to be, have a really good drag system on because there's a way to fight these fish. Uh, you're not going to be horsing them. I'm going to tell you that. If you, you try to you try to go you know, fist, fist to fist with these things, they're going to beat you down every single time. Um, as for line-wise, um, we're looking anywhere between 15 to 20 pounds of braid. Whatever braid you like. That's that's up to you. Um, I'm a suffix A32 guy. I've always used it. I've never had anything bad. Um, I have a guy Johnny on my boat. He he loves using 10 pound braid. I don't know why. He just loves sheep fishing with 10 pound braid. And um, honestly, it holds. He's only broken off a couple big fish, but I mean, 10 pounds is, it, it, it works. But recommended, I'd say anywhere between 15 and 20. My go-to is 15. It's my, my back base setup is 15 pounds for every fish back there. It could be a 40 pound bass, you know, to a 20, 20 inch fluke. It's 15 pounds all the way through. Uh, leader wise, you're going to do a three foot section of 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. They're not line shy, but I use the fluorocarbon just for abrasion purposes and it sinks better. And um, you go the, from braid to fluorocarbon, you're going to use one of those no swivels, no terminal tackle guys. It's just going to get in the way of everything. It's going to get hung up on the barbs, the barnacles. Um, if you can, learn it. If not, just reach out. I'll teach you it. Uh, FG Knot or Unity Uni or any of those specific uh, braid to uh, floral knots you guys like, any of those will work, as long as it gets through your guide. Because what happens is the first drop is your your rod tip is going to be literally six inches from the water. So you're, you, the knot's got to be able to flow through all those guides evenly. So, like I said, the better the slimmer the knot, the better the, the better it is because that knot's going to be going through your guides. Um, jig wise, um, this is a preference, guys. Um, there's so many jigs out there. Um, I've been using bottom sweepers since 2015. They, the way they're they the way they set up, the way they hook the crab, the way the crab stands, uh, I love it. It's always been my go-to. Uh, anywhere between quarter ounce to up to half ounce. If you got a fish heavier than half ounce, I suggest you go find something else to fish for. Uh, because three quarter ounce, it's undetectable. It's harder to detect. Three quarter ounce, I would suggest maybe if you're fishing off a jetty or something, which is fine. But usually if I have to go any more heavier than half ounce, I, I won't fish for sheeps. Um, Color-wise, there's lead, white, pink, orange, and chartreuse. So color-wise, everything's worked. Uh, me, for me, lead's always been the color I use. I, I won't... I I just throw lead on. Everybody also on my boat has different colors. One of my guys, he loves white. He only drops white. You know, one guy only drops orange. You know what I mean? Everyone drops their favorite color. Uh, for me, I've always used lead. Lead's always been good for me, just natural. Um, yeah, but speaking of jigs, you know what I mean? Like, whatever you guys like, whatever thing works out for you guys. Um, I know uh, Ed, he has he just released his new sheep's jig, and I told him that you know, this year I do a little R&D and research for him. Give, give it a go and give my you know give him my um opinion by the end of the season so like i said every every jig will catch sheep i'm not saying they won't um just got to get find out which one's the best one for you guys and whatever color works for me color has always been color has always been to catch fishermen not catch fish so yeah it's i it that's a tough topic right yeah. um i used to always say that but i was mentioning uh last week when uh, Northeast Jigs was on, when Mike was on, I I used to say that, and I went fishing. You know, I go fishing with Ed and Mike, and they're catching, but they're using a different color than me, and I'm literally next to them. I mean, our kayaks are bumping into each other, and I'm catching nothing until Ed makes fun of me, and I switch to the same color, and all of a sudden I'm catching. Um, but the I think the most underrated thing about any type of jig is. You were, I believe you are going to catch more fish when you're fishing with confidence. Mm -hmm. And if you have confidence in the color, you know, that helps a lot. So if you believe chartreuse is your color, 
this chartreuse, you yeah. know, and then if it's not working, then switch to another one. Um, but I, I have seen where not necessarily with sheep's head, because again, all of mine have been bycatch. Uh, but I, I have seen other fish where they just won't bite a certain color for whatever reason. And then as soon as I switch up, you know, they're, that they, they are turned on by that and they start, they start biting. So, you know, we have a couple of comments on this. I'll bring up this one first. Um, Josh, uh, you know, I think this was answered. What is your opinion though? My, like my thought is on the second part of this, any specific colors and patterns, you already talked about that, but what about matching the bait that you're dropping down? You know, a sand flea color, when you're dropping sand fleas or an Asian shore crab or mussel, if you're dropping something like a, a mussel or a clam down there? Um, as for matching your ch your jig head to your actual bait, um, that's just something I never got into. You know what I mean? I know with the, the just the season and last season, the guys are really starting to get into that whole coloring game. You know, there's like the orange and yellow to match like green crabs, the brown. Yeah. I've seen that. Um, I had, I've honestly, I've never gotten into it. Like all my sheep's always been cotton on, lead gotcha. pink orange just super solid basic colors nothing crazy i um, mean it may it may do, do help um because it just kind of blends in but i think honestly if a sheep's hungry and he sees a, uh, a fiddler or something like that drop in front of his face he's just going to eat it yeah it, it'll be interesting when you test out those those yep. jigs from ed uh, i believe they're called the sheep herders um, yep it, it'll be interesting to see you know especially on the days where you're not having the, the production that you were hoping for and if you get to the point where you put those on just to see and see if it, it does make a difference at some point I, I think that'll be interesting to to hear about and then josh had another one uh um, yeah he, this was earlier much earlier that he asked this but the rod reel and line you already covered that but did you talk specifically um or would you talk specifically about braid and your per, your preference for uh brand of braid Okay. Yeah, I think we. I just discussed it a little bit earlier, but I'll just I'll I'll go right back into it. So as for braid wise, um, I'm always looking between 15 and 20 pounds. Um, for me specifically, it's always been 15 pounds because as you're a fluke fisherman, you know, small diameter, the better it cuts through the water, and yep. especially fishing these kind of uh, currents and stuff, you want to be able to cut that water as quick as possible and be as small a diameter so the water just pretty much goes around it instead of causing a um kind of like a bubble or what do you call it those little weird loops so yeah you don't want you don't want i mean you can use 20 i have guys to use 20 i have one rod that's on my boat that's set for 20 but i've used 15 but 15 20 is fine as long as it cuts the water and your presentation is usually vertical as long as you get a straight vertical uh presentation you're good to go what you don't want is your uh, line to scope out away from the pie and when that happens is what happens is the current probably caught your jig or caught your line and it's pulling it out so you want your jig as close or pretty much touching the structure while as you're fishing. And um, this is fishing wise, this is what I'm talking about, but more like more towards pilings and, and stuff like that. Um, top shot, uh, no top shot for me, just the uh, 20 pound fluorocarbon liter is all you're going to need. Uh, three foot, about three feet of that, uh, 20, yeah, 20 pounds should be perfect. Um, line wise, uh, I've always used suffix A32. Everyone has their own preference. Line wise, it's not a big deal. Um, I think that's, yeah. was that, was that the only cut? Yep. That, okay. that covers it. I mean, the rod and reel you've already talked about. Um, yep. so yeah, I think we got that covered. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Yeah. So the, uh, the other alternative rig, it's more of a Southern thing, but I mean, I mean, I, I, I assume it would work up here. I haven't tried it yet. Cause I've always been using jigs, but, uh, like a quarter ounce split shot drop down to maybe a, uh, a number size two octopus hook, um, uh, it's always been something those guys down south use a lot. You know, knocker rigs is what they call them down there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I assume they work the same exact way up here, so it wouldn't be any different. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, down south, just just um, two years ago, they were turned on to the jigs for she for sheep's head. Yeah. And it was a totally northern thing. I mean, it started out of, the, of this area, um, and to them, they were they were so excited about it, but meanwhile they're still catching on these these same rigs um, mm -hmm. so if you prefer rigs over jigs i think you'd be uh you know i think you're, you're probably going to be okay i would also say and and this is my this is my uh theory Qua. i'd like to hear your opinion on yep. it um if you if you do have the heavy currents and you are having trouble with that small jig getting it down there 
if you rig it with the weight on the bottom um, and then you have the, the hooks on droppers above, you could get away with more weight to bring it down and keep it more vertical. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. That's kind of like bottom fishing, but at the same time, it's very, it's going to be more harder to detect the bite. Yes. With that kind of setup, because uh, if you ever seen the sheep feed or if you ever noticed the sheep feed, I've watched enough videos that they, their feed is usually from the bottom. They're, they're they, they come from the bottom and they come up on your bait. So they'll really grab it from the, from the bottom and this is where it gets complicated because either they're going to lift it up and you're going to see the slack in your line or they're going to grab it and they're going to swim away with it. Is, right. and, and that that's when you know you're going to set the hook. Very rarely, like Tog, they're going to grab it and go down on it. They never will. Um, right. You'll get one in 10 fish that's going to try to yank the rod out of your hand. And that's, you know, that's a sure thing. But nine times out of 10, that sheep is very subtle bite, very light. And you're not you're not gonna feel the bite. You're gonna feel you're gonna see your line tick, and, and I'll cover this in a little bit. It's gonna do a little pause, a hesitation, a little slack, or your your jig just starts swimming away on its own. Yeah, that's yep. a good point. Yeah, and that's a, that's a whole other section. Um, yep. Just a couple other quick things. Michael is is mentioning the shorter rods, mm -hmm. six foot three. Um, I I will say this in a kayak. I generally advocate for having uh, shorter rods. So I use a set. Well, a longer actually, a mm -hmm. seven to a seven six depending on the size of your kayak because you want to be able to work it around the front without having to shift your weight too much. Yeah. However, if you're fishing heavy structure in close and overhead, like a bridge, mm -hmm. I hate having seven foot rods. Yeah. Um, so I actually have some that are six foot. Um, I think I have a six, three, I have a five, whatever, five, eight or something like that, mm -hmm. that I'm going to be bringing out for this, this year, because it's just, it's a nightmare when, you know, you're already worried about the kayak and keeping it positioned. Uh, you can't hold on like you can in a boat necessarily. Uh, so unless you're tying off the kayak and jumping up on the piling yourself, it, you know, you, you always have to worry about those rods and, and keeping them in tight. I, yeah. I would definitely advocate for that, that shorter rod. There was also, I gotta say this, this will be um, a little bit of confidence for you coming into Coming into the season, Qua, a lot of big sheep's head on Ed's, Ed's jigs last year. I wish I had some of those pictures. Um, there's some some nice ones that, that he had pulled in last year. Very nice. But, and then the, the last one I want to put up on this topic, John, uh, who's actually one of the members of this channel, has a question. Mm -hmm. So he uses a barrel swivel. Yep. Uh, yep. I went through this uh, a few minutes ago, but yeah, we'll go through it again. So uh, um, I don't use any terminal tackle on the setup. It's usually braid right to a uh, 20 pound fluoro carbon um, with a, one of those um, slim knots, whether it be an FG knot or a uni to uni. Um, either one of those works. This year I've literally started tying FG knots because I found them to be a lot more stronger. And then like yeah. I've broken a lot of uni uni knots. So this year it's been, I mean, past two years I've been doing uni to unis and they've been very structurally sound. Yeah. I, I use the FG John, uh, you and I are way overdue to meet out on the water. I will, uh, if we, let's say we go out on a party boat, you and I can just sit on the way out and I'll show you how to do the FG knot fairly quickly. I've gotten to the point where I can do it in complete darkness. No. Um, and I can do it when I'm moving between spots. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I would recommend that definitely. It's because, and the main reason is what you had mentioned earlier. You're, you're going to be pulling that knot through the guides. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, especially when you're on heavy structure, you're going to need that. Um, now I'm not saying high stick the fish, but you that that's going to be coming through those guides quite often. And you want the lowest profile, uh, least snaggy knot on there. A barrel swivel will just end up knocking the, uh, the insert out of that rod, that rod tip. So mm -hmm. I, John, I will show you how to do the FG knot in person when we get together on the water. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once you learn these knots, they're incredible and they're going to be very efficient, especially if you're a night fisherman too. Sometimes, you know, as a day fisherman, yeah, we can, we can crank it and just see the kind of barrel coming out when to stop. But as a night fishing and I've served fish for a very long time, uh, yeah, you don't want to be cranking in the middle of the night and you don't know where your swivel is at until it hits your eye guide up top and crack a guide, you know? So yeah, swivel, swivels have their time and their place. 
You know what I mean? It's it's depending on what we're doing because we don't want line twists or any of that. But the way we're fishing for sheeps, there's there, there's no need for line twists. Agreed. All right. So uh, one last rig before I even talk about it is something I'm going to try implementing this year. And it's, it's going to be more like uh, specifically for the jetty is the float rigs. Uh, a lot of guys in Florida, Mississippi, Texas, South Carolina, they've been using float rigs for sheep for a very long time. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna start adapting it and see if I can get it to work with, you know, our jetties out here. Um, pretty much it's just going to be set up as a slip rig, slip bobber rig, find the right debt, find the correct debt, and literally just float that float that rig all the way down the jetty and until you find a sheep that's, that's going to um, commit to it. Because you got to think, if you're going to float it down, Tog don't usually come up for bait. You know, Tog love to sit on the bottom and pick off stuff. They rarely come up. So if you try to set that float rig probably five feet, you know, anywhere between three and five feet above where the Tog zone is, a sheep will come up and get it. Guaranteed they will. Now, you're talking about the float rigs. Are you talking about just a regular float rig or are you talking about like a popping cork? No, no, like a regular float rig. Okay. Yeah, popping cork is a whole another game for strikers. <laughs> Yes, it works. Another southern thing that should be used more. Implemented. I, I've, I've noticed that I'm going to start trying adapting a lot of our southern guys down there, their styles up here, because the fishery may not be the same, but the tactics will work. Uh, I agree 100%. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, if we have no more questions this slide, we're going to move on to the next one. All good. All right. All right, so another important topic in our area is going to be baits and types of baits. All right, see those choppers? Those are what we are competing with. You know, a mouth only a mother could love. So they have those little grinders on the bottom, those two, those front buck teeth that look like human teeth. Those are what they use on their first initial bite to actually crush your crabs that are on, or barnacles or whatever, what they may be. Um, they use those for barnacles specifically off of pylons. They use those to break and pluck them off, and then they slide the actual bait into those grinders and their back teeth, and then they grind them down. Very interesting. And you got to remember later down the line and during their slides, the uh, hook set is going to be very important. Super solid hook set because that's what you're going to be setting through. Those rows of teeth and those kind of buck teeth. You know, you got to be setting, you got to set hard. All right, next slide. All right, first crab we have locally here in, I would say all of Jersey almost. I've seen them up north, and I've seen but a majority of them. I've seen them down south. Fiddler crabs. Um, they can be find, found anywhere during low tides, uh, found on beaches, marshes. Um, you just wander around, you'll find them. You'll know they're around because you'll see little holes in the sand or the mud. Um, if you can't find them wandering around, because you, you find them really good during hot days because what they do is they wander away from their holes look for water and food and stuff and that's the best ideal time to be able to catch them uh if you can't catch them that way you just look for their holes and what you do is you literally just start um trying to dig their holes out uh there's a couple tricks you can find on youtube that will show you how to catch these fiddlers a lot faster but majority of the time uh for me it's like it's running and dashing you throw in some gloves you run through the marshes and you just literally just pretty much like a kid just running and grabbing them that's that's my best advice to trying to get them yeah and they they do hurt when they bite or when they grab you so be careful um but one thing that does help well unless you find kids around that you can pay to get them they'll, they'll get you 10 times faster than any of us can but bring a shovel a long handled shovel and they will sit near the mouth of the hole and you can jam the shovel behind them and cut off the uh the tunnel and then they're stuck in that little section then you can just grab the sand with the crab inside and just throw it in a bucket that's the easiest way i found unless you're going to make a trap or something like that or pay a kid to do it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're a great bait, especially down in South Jersey. They're, I, to me, they're a little bit more rare up north, but down in South Jersey, anywhere near sod banks, they're all over the place. Yep, yep. And our buddies over at uh, Tight Lines Bait and Tackle, they do get them in, but yeah. he gets them shipped in from Florida. So they're Floridian fiddlers. They're not local fiddlers. So, um, he, I mean, he's still trying to find find a way to keep them alive longer uh, i've been helping him trying to figure out separate ways so hopefully this season he'll have them um let's see moving on <coughs> now asian shore crabs um you guys have probably seen these if you're a togger these these are one of your delicacies um same thing they're fine at low tide flipping rocks anywhere near shorelines and jetties you'll be able to find them um they're a super invasive species that came here around the 80s 
Uh, no one brought them here. They kind of just climbed into like the bilge pumps of these uh, vessels, the sh shipping containers and stuff like that. And then where they got to the docks here, they literally crawled out and uh, yeah, they pretty much invaded almost all of our areas. Just as bad as green crabs, but you know, but they are a fantastic bait. Now, if you want to rate baits, these are my number one. Fiddlers are number two. And then the next one's going to be my number three. Um, that's, but just let, just for you guys, it's make sure you guys have as different kind of baits as you can on the boat. Some days, sheep don't care. They'll eat anything you drop in front of their face. Other days, they're kind of super picky. So have, have for me, I've always have Asian shore crabs and always have fiddlers. Those are the two I have on the boat at all times. I'll have one guy fishing one and have one guy fishing the other. And whichever one kind of gets the more attention, I'll tell everyone to switch. All right. So uh, next one is pretty popular here in South Jersey is uh, in North Jersey, uh, sand fleas or mole crabs as we used to call them. Um, they're not that hard to catch. You just got to find the right beaches that hold them. They're right where the shore break is as the water hits and rises up the beach and then it resides damp it down. Uh, you can run out with your hands, scoop them up, and toss like toss the whole pile of sand of sand onto the dry area, and you'll be able to pick them out or pay a kid just to play in the dirt all day and catch them. Um, they are great, fantastic bait. People love them for sheep down south. Um, we don't use them much up here for sheep, honestly. Um, I know a couple guys that do, um, but they're really great talk bait too. So, um, but they are an alternative if you can't find shore crabs or if you can't find fiddlers. Uh, for sand fleas, they are pretty much a one hit wonder. If you get something to hit it, it's gone. You're, you're not getting a second shot. All right. Uh, let's see. And then you can use a sand flea rake. If you can find one of those locally that local shops that do sell a sand flea rake, pretty much run down the beach, scrape up the sand and shake them out. Uh, you could definitely fill a five gallon bucket in less than like an hour. Now, as for sand fleas, if you don't use them all in a day, there is a way to preserve them so you can continue using them. Uh, it's called blanching. So what you do is you pretty much heat up uh, boiling water. Once the water boils, you literally turn the water off, drop the sand fleas in, take it off and, and give them about, about a 30, 45 second bath until they turn a little pink, pull them out and then you dry them and then you vacuum seal them and stay sit in your fridge and they are perfectly ready to use the next time they're out there. All yeah, right. you can also eat them. Yeah, you can also eat them. They taste yeah. just like shrimps and crabs from what yeah. I hear. Yep. All right. So alternative baits. A lot of these are Southern baits. Uh, they do work up here. I've never used them. I stick to my two favorites, my shore crabs and my fiddlers. But hey, you never know. If you run out of bait, you can't find bait. You got you got to use an alternative, right? So first one's going to be shedder crabs. Now you can get, you can find them, you can buy them. Uh, they are fantastic baits, actually, for sheep's head. Every time we've actually got one on the boat, we see them swimming, so we scoop them up. Just make sure they're legal, guys. Uh, I think what what are our size for shedder crabs? Like three inches or something, three and a half. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember, but you, that's one of those things you have to be very careful about. Yeah, be very careful. Make sure it is a legit shedder crab. Um, you, you'll see them swim around. You can scoop them. Um, yeah, so you cut them in low, low pieces, low chunks, put them on your jig, drop them right down. That's, for some reason, they are like cheap candy because they have this pheromone that comes out of them because they're shedders, yeah. and they're, they're just incredible. Just people, weak fish love them. Like everything loves them, you know. They have this pheromone that gets – excreted from the juices as you are if they they can't stay on the hook long enough uh shrimp people don't know this but down in south jersey we do have a brown shrimp fishery i mean it's not enough to harvest and sell but we do have brown shrimp in our backwaters and they are they get pretty big i've i've accidentally cast netted a few you know a dozen or two by accident looking for like mullet and stuff so we do have shrimp back here uh oysters and clams you know if you guys can get them and get them to stay on the hook without falling off. Fantastic idea. And then we got uh, barnacles. Barnacles is a primary food of sheep's head. If you do cut one open, nine times out of ten, it's going to be filled full of barnacles. Um, because they're the easiest to access, and they have those teeth that can just rip them right off. I've never tried breaking off barnacles and fishing with them. Um, it's a good just way to get cut. Yeah, it's a good way to get cut, and also I'm not sure about the, the laws of that here. Because I know in Florida, where we used to scrape them off the pilings to chum up the water for the sheeps. Uh, the only reason I say that here because we have oyster populations and it's illegal to do that. So I don't suggest it. But I mean, if you can pretty much walk down to a bridge and scrape some pilings 
like you know like at low tide you know you're not damaging any of the ecosystem with the oysters and stuff like that um i barnacles may work i haven't tried them uh last but not least is sea urchins uh we have them here i i've never fished with them but i hear from a lot of guys that sea urchins are a very good prime bait yeah i'm not gonna fish with them we have, <laughs> a, we have a question uh on the baits yeah Yep, I see the uh, yeah the spawn sacks just the same way with like trout and steelheads and stuff like that. It's a good way to keep oysters on. It, it definitely is. Um, I know that down south the guys on Florida they love using oysters in, in spawn sacks, and I've never tried them up here. Um, I assume they would work because they leave off the scent, and oysters are irresistible to to sheep's head. You know they just leave off those juices. All right, I think this is where our first video is. Yes, it is. Yep. All right. Let me bring this up right here. All right. Hopefully you guys can hear me or don't hear me. But uh, if you t pay close attention to that sheep's head, he's eating barnacles right off the side of that piling. You know, you see how they feed. They kind of use their pecs and they kind of swim sideways or forward, you know, whatever they need. You can just imagine this is, um, this is what they're going to be doing, the same exact thing 10, 15 feet down. This guy just happened to be feeding on top. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's, that's awesome. I mean, you can just see it right there, just ripping at the bar yep. barnacles. Yep. He's pucking them off and this video will come back in just a couple moments to kind of demonstrate a certain, uh, tactic and area that they like to swim. All right. Next up is going to be the, uh, technique, the art of vertical jigging. And this is, it's just something I've done for the past seven years and pretty much, uh, it works extraordinary for me. Um, and when we mean jigging, we're not literally talking about you popping the rod up and down jigging. This is, it's a slow and very, it's a, it's a very cool technique that helps you fish the full water column, top to bottom. All right. If you guys can see the photos, I might have to stretch because my eyes aren't that great neither. All right. So as you see, if you can see where the current is, it's coming around this piling. So the, you have the current coming from the, uh, the top, as you can see, and then it hits the piling. So what happens once it hits the piling? The water gets diverted onto the sides, which is what we call the uh, the horseshoe vortex. So that's the outside current that's going to go around that piling. Now, the uh, as I always say, you always have to fish the leeward side of the structure. When I mean leeward side, is is usually the uh, the less current side. So that would be that uh, that that gray area right behind that piling where it has those arrows that kind of like circling. See, this is where my pointer would come in. I would just be pointing. But yeah, so that 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 portion of water is where the water swirls now if you look tight right against that pond you see that little empty kind of like triangle white area well that's where you're going to fish that's where you want to fish because if you put your jig anywhere outside that horseshoe vortex or even that gray that gray spot with the the circular arrow your 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 jig or your line is going to get pushed out right into the current so you want to fish right directly literally inches or even pretty much right up against touching that pond that's where you want to be. You, that's where your rod tip is going to be. You're going to have it six inches above the water. So that's why I said that uh, FG knot is going to be perfect because you're going to crank down all the way to the hub. Leave about leave about maybe maybe about five six inches of line with your jig, and you're literally going to lower your rod tip right to that piling, like right against it. Like you can touch it if you want. And then what you're going to do is this is going to be a two hand effect. You're going to hold one hand steady, and you're going to open your bail. All right, you're going to open your bail and then you're going to drop your jig. You're going to drop your jig down. This is how you work the full top to bottom column. You drop your jig three feet. All right, once you get to about three feet, you feel it, lock your, close the bail. You're going to hold your rod there. Just hold it still. Don't move it. Now, now if you, you hold it there for a good 10, 15 seconds and you don't get no, you don't get nothing, open your bail again, drop it another three feet, four feet, close your bail. Now you work that whole water column from, if it's 30 feet, you go from the top. You work all the way down to the bottom, and then if you don't get no bites, you bring it back up, and you do it one more time. Um, and that's how you work. You know, and you're going to work each column. You know, Whatever columns you can get to, work that column. Um, don't stay on a single piling too long. If sheep are, the, if the sheeps are home, they'll let you know. They'll let you know real quick. So I, I always say be, be like a, a bass fisherman, largemouth bass fisherman, power fish. Fish an area super hard, quickly efficiently move on to another move on to another area 
Um, and as you're doing this over the years, you're going to develop a, what I call a high percentage area. You're going to have a certain amount of area that you've caught fish before and you kind of have an idea. So what you're going to do is you're going to power fish all these areas really quick because um, that's, that's the only way you're going to find fish. There's no, there's no way that you're going to predict where these fish are going to be. There's a pattern that they'll be in that area for two, three days, but they're going to move. So like it's always, you just got to power fish these pilings, power fish areas that you know have a high percentage of fish. Um, let's see. I uh, got through all that. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just add. I uh, when I was fishing this summer and I had a little bit of time at the end of the day, I was going for sheep at a bridge right near the launch. And you know, you say the two to three foot increments. I know I was getting sheep that were hitting it, and mm -hmm. I, I just was unable to set the hook. And what was interesting is I did this exact technique that you know you had outlined this with me in the past. And I would, uh, it was always on the third opening of the bale. Mm -hmm. So now That's I got about, stripped and I yeah. brought it back up, but I didn't go directly to the same depth. I was like, well, maybe it moved up. Mm -hmm. And then I did one drop, nothing, two drops, nothing. Here comes third drop, bang, right there. And I, and then I, you know, I just kept doing that. I only had a little bit of bait left. It was just leftover flounder bait, but, um, it was interesting. They they were there, and you're right. They let me know within seconds of it hitting that depth, but mm -hmm. they weren't coming up two feet to get it above them. They, no. were, they were waiting for it to get to them, and then they were hitting it. Exactly. Um, I always say that if you get a sheep to bite, you crank it right up right away, rebate, and drop down. You, you'll you get an opportunity. You'll only get about three to four chances, and then that's it. It's over. But it'll be the same fish at that same exact depth. So if he hit... Say you you said you he, he hit you at like the third bale opening, so we're giving nine, twelve feet, something like that, right? Yep. So if you know that exact, you can you can you can bypass all that, drop it, it drop it all the way down to nine feet and feel it, and and he'll be at the exact same water column. He's not going anywhere, but you'll you'll only get to feed him three to four crabs before he's gone. Uh. So yeah, it happened uh, two seasons last season, might be two seasons ago. Yeah, I have one of my buddies on the boat, Larry, first time she's fishing. I got him, gets the piling. I told him to do it. He dropped it. First five feet, he gets whaled. But he doesn't see it. He's just he's thinking it's a tall fishing type. So he's 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 a tall fisherman. So he's he gets whaled. And then and like he doesn't see it because it didn't take the bait. It didn't take the line. It just ticked his line. I saw his line flick. Yeah. I was like, dude, your bait's gone. He's like, what? I was like, he pulls it up, gone. I was like, put <laughs> another bait on real quick. Dropped it down. Same thing. Got him again. I was like, dude, what are you doing? And then Bait another bait, dropped it down. He's watching it now, right? So this time he sees it, but he reacted way too late. So he missed it again. And then I was just like, dude, you got one more shot at this guy and he's gone. And so I was like, just watch that line. And he, so he drops it down exactly five feet again. His line barely flicked, but he saw it and he set. He, yeah, he set into that fish and that thing took off. Yeah, it, I think he, it came up. It was like six and a half, seven pounds. So he got to feed that fish three crabs before he finally got to hook them. Yeah, that's awesome, I and mean, that's something to keep in mind. You gotta, you gotta think before you just drop it down there because you need to know where it is where you got that strike. Yeah, I like Mike's comment over there. He's like, "Great show," but I'm telling too much. Hey, look, guys, um, it's one of those fisheries that I would love. I would love to see more guys with the photo of them catching and releasing. I just want everyone to be able to get the opportunity to catch one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I said, I could tell you guys spots. I mean, I could tell you guys spots, bait, technique, everything. But you guys have to all put this together, you know, together perfectly to be able to, to do it. There are days when I've gone out and fished 12 hours and haven't caught a single one. So it's a, it's like you, I could teach everything to you until until you put all this knowledge to work. It's it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah, well, I can vouch for that. <laughs> I can definitely vouch for that. All right. Let's move on to the next slide. All right. So we're back to this slide again. So if you guys pay attention before, before, um, before Rich plays it, remember that area I told you that where the fit, where we are going to fish behind that lee. So you're going to notice that the currents are going around that piling up on top and actual on the bottom. And you can see where the currents are swirling. Now you're going to see exactly where this sheep is actually feeding. He's right in that area where I said, there's barely any current sitting. All right. Here it goes. All right, so he's on the right side of that current right now. So 
boom, right there, right where he's at, right there is where it is pretty much the calmest part of that pond because that water is wrapping around there. And he's just, he's just barely, barely, barely pedaling and he's just feeding off easily. So he doesn't want to fight current. So he's trying to stay right behind that eddy. I know where that is, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm just kidding. Yeah, because I don't even know where that is. <laughs> you know, somebody's trying. Somebody's getting on Google Maps right now, trying to find that. <laughs> trying to find that white, that white sheeting, and the boards and yeah. docks. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah. Let me let me bring um, this up. Garrett had a question. I want to bring it up. Yeah. Maybe it's too early to bring this up, so you let me know. That's fine. We can talk. Uh, sweeping hook set or a six to twelve. Hmm. This might be well, the, my this is, question. It is. It's a good question. This this question really depends on where you're fishing, Garrett. Um, if you're fishing on a piling that literally you can do a perfect vertical jig and you have the room to hook set from six to twelve, go for it. You know, definitely go for it. It's that's the best hook set straight up and down. Um, it's going to be a solid hook set. Now, there's certain areas, you know, under docks, um, bunkers, any of those that areas that you have very limited areas to hook set, that's when you're going to have to go with a sweeping hook set. Now, the sweeping hook set is going to help you because now you're going to actually have to make a different kind of approach to the hook, um, the hook set itself. Um, but I've never really had any problem doing a sweeping hook set or a 6 to 12 hook set. So, uh all depending on what area and the structure you type. There's areas where I'm fishing under a small bulkhead as I have a hook set room about six inches. You know, that 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 handicaps all of us because we want that monster hook set because we got to drive that. But at the same time, these hooks are super sharp. And if you get the right hook set and then the right solid fish, it's going to hook himself pretty much. And you're just yeah. adding in, adding the drive. So that, that was going to be my question. So, you know, people hook set differently for different fish. Um, I mm -hmm. tend to do a very short, compact, fast hook set. Yeah. You know, so you won't see me doing the um, the build dance, you know, fall off the other side of the boat type of hook set if it drops it. Yeah. Um, I'm always just very short, very fast raise. And then, you know, like with a tog, that can get you in trouble because you're not pulling mm -hmm. you away from that structure. But yeah. I'm on the reel immediately. Um, do you find like that's enough or, or are you saying let's use the biggest hook set that you can when the conditions allow it? Um, this, this is where your rod comes into play. If you have the right rod, like a rod with a solid backbone, but a, a decent fast tip, that's super, super, uh, super solid that, yeah. that you don't, you're going to, your short hook set would be perfect because it's literally a two, three, you know, maybe two feet hook set, maybe less than that, you know, 10 inches, yeah. 12 inches. That hook set should be more enough to drive that hook through that fish. Now, if you have something like a noodle rod, like with like you know like a medium light that literally flexes on the bend, right? You're not going to be having enough force to drive that hook through there. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, if you do have one of those light rods, you can initially set the hook on them, and then as you're backing away out of the structure or whatnot, you can add a secondary hook set just to make sure you get that guaranteed drive. That that's that's normally how I hook everything. You know, I get it, I hook it, and then I pull it a little bit, and then I and then I drive it home later. Yep. yep. I don't know if that's right or wrong. It, it works for me, though. But there are some fish where you can't do that. You know, think of a weak fish. You no, you can't. Weak fish. Hook yeah. set. You, don't want, you don't want to ever do a second hook set on a weak fish. So when I'm targeting mm -hmm. them, you know, it's it's one. Or, you know, or specs, especially, because I, yeah. I fish more for specs than weak fish. Um, you definitely don't want to be tearing that mouth. Yeah, they got that paper mouse, and you don't want to be doing the major, major craze. But yeah, these uh, sheep yeah. they're super, they're super hardy with their teeth, man. Their their jaws are like super hard. They got all those teeth we got to go through. So a nice solid hook set should be good. Yep. All right, let's move on. All right, so here are the type of structures that um, I talked about: vertical jigging. Now we're now we're going to start focusing on um, saw banks, mussel beds, and oysters. <clears throat> uh, the few times I've done this had some success, caught some fish. Um, I don't usually target side banks, but there there is a time and a place for uh, side bank fishing for tog. And usually, what you when you'll find that is when you'll find um, like you'll start seeing like fiddlers and stuff falling off the side banks. If you ever seen that kind of, it's kind of funny. 
Uh, it does happen in our area, and you'll see tall, literally you'll see tall sitting right underneath these side bangs waiting for these fiddlers to literally fall in their mouths. Um, and usually that's when the time you're going to target. So what you're looking for uh, on side banks is, as we talked a little bit early, is um, broken chunks, uh, muscle beds, oyster beds. As long as you have that kind of bottom, sheep's head are tend to be around. But for me, I've always targeted side banks with big broken chunks because, as we talked earlier, the, talk, the, the, the sheep's head love to sit behind these side banks. They, they love to sit behind these um, chunks. So what I usually do is um, I'll go down maybe a, a channel or a, a creek or something that I know that has a decent, a, some nice current, turn on my uh, side scans on my, on my hummingbird. And I'll do just cruise kind of up it and just kind of look on the sides of my side scans, see if I see any broken chunks. You know, you'll see it on your, your side scans, broken chunks, broken chunks, left side, broken chunk, right side. Just kind of make a mental note of where you saw a broken chunk by the, 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 the side bank landmarks. Cause you know, it just broke off. Then I'll usually go all the way up current, sit up there, get, try to get my nose pointed. If I have to use my trolling motor, I will just to kind of keep my nose in one spot. And just, it would just be like drifting for fluke. You literally drift back. And you just let it draw. If you control your drift, do nice, decent drift. Um, and you're going to try to use your light jig head. As light as you can get, get away with without being, like, above it. And you still have to have contact with it, but not dragging the bottom. So, you know, whatever lightest jig head you can, you're going to put your bait on. You're literally going to you're going to cast not cast but kind of flip your uh, bank your, your um, jig up current and then you're going to flip you're going to drift back with your boat. You're just going to you kind of just it's going to be raising your tip kind of like so you just still feel the bottom and you're going to get to that you, you're going to have that mental note of where that chunk of side bank is and you're going to you're literally going to what you do is going to hop it on top of the side bank or or over it. So you're going to hop it. So what happens is when you hop it on top of that side bank and then you hop it one more time. It's going to come right off the backside of that side bank where the lee is, where that where there's no current. And nine times out of ten, your sheep's going to be sitting right there. And he's going to look up. He's going to see it. He's going to come up. He's going to pick that. He's going to pick that crab. These bites you're going to feel a little bit more because they're they're going up and they're grabbing it and they're coming back down because they're already on the bottom. Because besides tog, these sheep's are also fighting off striped bass that are sitting behind that side bank too. Yeah. So now they saying they're a little bit more aggressive when they're on the side banks. Um, so that's and for me, it's like I've always told guys, hook sets are free. If you feel anything weird on the uh, off the initial drop off the side banks, set the hook. It could be you could be setting up on a piece of grass. I don't care if it feels weird. If it's a weird tip, if it doesn't pop right. It you feel weird slack. Set the hook and set hard. That's all I tell them. Now, uh, when you're doing this slow bounce, um, mm -hmm. is it correct to say that you're not jigging so much as just maintaining contact with the jig? Correct. You're not jigging. You're not jigging up and down. You're just you're just maintaining contact of your jig for the fact that you don't want it to get hung up because the jig yeah. is going. You're going to be you're going you're going to be up and up and down for contact at the same speed as your boat, so you don't get hung up. Yeah, it's okay. literally what it is. So okay. you're just literally going back, back, back. It's not literally jigging. It's just kind of bouncing it so it stays at the same speed as your boat so you don't get hung up or anything. All right. Let's see. What's up? All right. One of the most important things about sheep's head fishing is going to be the bite, the hook, and also the fight. All right. Now, sheep's head, as I discussed earlier, is their bite is very light, very subtle. Um, nine times out of ten, I call it super focused fishing because – you're not feeling the bite off your rod tip. You're going to feel the bite on your line. You're going to watch your line. This is the most, if you guys never been focused fishing, this is it. This is when you're going to be staring at your line the hardest. And it's it, it's going to be crickets on the boat or the kayak because no one's going to make a sound because everyone's watching their lines. What you're looking for is you're looking for your line to uh, any kind of change. As you drop down that that column of water, you're going you're gonna to know like it's going to be repetitive you're going to feel it you know every movement what you're going to feel when when it happens is it's going to be something different and that's what you're looking for whether it be a tick like a little pause in your line definitely slack if you see your line dropping all of a sudden it just stops or you just see slack come up and you're going to set the hook you're going to set you're going to set hard you know it may be accidentally hanging up on a, a seaweed you know 
beard or something like that or a piece of muscle, but hook sets are free, guys. Like I said, anything that's different, you set the hook on it. You set hard. Uh, anything up in that higher water column is 100% it's going to be a, a sheep because togs are sitting on the bottom and bat and striped bass will only usually hook your jig. We will only attack your jig on the actual retrieve. When you bring it back in, there's plenty of times when we fish, we hit the bottom, we bring our jigs back up. Striped bass comes out of nowhere and inhales it. We think it's like a ginormous sheep or something, but no, it's, it's a, like a 26, 28 inch striped bass. They do it all the time. They scared the bejesus out of us. Um, yeah. Also, if you see your jig moving, if you're holding in one place for that, that 10, 15 second, if you're holding it there, and all of a sudden you see your line kind of just kind of move away. What happens is that sheep literally put put it in his mouth array and he's swimming away with your jig and you're going to want to set. Um, so when you set the hook, nice solid hook set, guys. Like make it sure it's a good solid hook set. And once you set that hook, don't fight the fish. This is the common mistake where a sheep will break you off every single time. Uh, it's always, it's always like I said, it's always structure dependent. But nine times out of ten, it's an area that's very sticky, and then they can they can go because what they do is, sheep's when they hook, they swim right to the bottom because that's that's the way they were always programmed to do. And then if you fight them, what they're going to do is instead of going down, which is what you want them to do, they're going to go sideways. And when you when they go sideways, is when they're going to get into that piling, they're going to get into that rubble, they're going to get into the rocks, wherever they can. You want them to swim straight down because that's. That's the that's the best opportunity for you for you to be able to fight them and have your drag set well. It's it, enough for you to set the hook, but enough for him to take off because he's like a be when you hook him, he's gonna be like a speeding bullet. It, your drag is just gonna rip right off that spool. But you gotta have enough enough to get tension on the line and at the same time be able to keep him there and occupy because he's you're gonna let him do his thing. I always tell guys when you, when you set the hook on a sheep, just hold your rod there, keep the bend in the line, and let him do his thing. He's gonna he's gonna want to run down, let him run down because that's that he's he's just gonna peel all that drag, and after you get that hook set and you you're already have him in a good spot, this is where the captain comes in or whoever is managing the boat or if you're the kayaker, get into open water, you know whether you got to use your trolling motor, you got to use your paddle, your pedal, whatever you got to use, get into open water because you stand a better chance fighting this fish in open water than you are in structure. I mean you can horse him, but with the light rod setup we're going to have, if it's a, if it's a 12, 13 pound fish, he's going to bust you off hundred percent. He will. They got that kind of power. Um, telltale signs. If, if it's a sheep or a, uh, or a tog, um, tog has that signature head, head bump. You know, when you get a tog, you hear thump, thump, thump nine times. It's not really their head shake. It's just their tail. So it's a big broom. It's sweeping back and forth and it makes it feel like it's digging up a tog. Once he hits, he's going to run straight to the bottom. It's going to be one solid drag peel. You know, it's going to zip line off kind of like, like say, an Albie. He's just going to pull line. He's going to pull line straight to the bottom. It's going to be one long run. Um, and you're going to prepare for multiple runs. That's why I say get into open water because, I mean, if it's a 10-plus pound fish, I expect at least three to four decent runs. He's going to come up. He's going to see the boat. He's going to take a dash right to the bottom again. Same thing. You're going to fight him. He's going to come up, and then he's going to go down. Like I said, once you get in open water, and you you have like a safe area that you know you can fight him. Tighten the drag up a little bit, you know. Then you put, start putting the heat on him, but still give him room because he's still got a penny of power. He's gonna make multiple runs, now anywhere between three to four runs. Um, if it's a big fish, like my biggest fish, I think was like two years ago, was like thirteen thirty or something like that. Uh, I had to fight him for like almost ten minutes, 10, 12 minutes. Like he just didn't want to come up. He came up, saw the net, went right back down. You can imagine me fishing by myself. I got a man the trolling motor fight the fish and have a net in my hand at the same time on a big fish. So um, they are super hard fighting fish guys uh, because of the way their bodies are built. Uh, if you guys ever been porgy fishing, you know, on one of the party boats and you get into a nice like pork chop, like two pounder or something like that, they dig, they dig and they dig for their lives. So I always said if a porgy ever got to 10 pounds, how would it fight? I was like, well, you just, you just described the sheep. No, sheep's pretty much a 10 pound porgy with stripes. That's how hard they fight. Um, yeah, they have their body. It's nice and fat and the way it's shaped. So all they got to do is turn sideways into the current. And they, that's where all their, their, their power is. Um, yeah, yeah that, they do. That's make, a, that's a big mm -hmm. point. You know, if you just look at the shape of them, once they get the current on the side, it's like, it's like, it turns into surf fishing. Now yeah. you have to fight the current on top of the fish. 
which which goes back to your get out in open water. So if you're drifting with it and it starts and the current starts helping it, it's it's not going to help it nearly as much as if you're trying to hold that bridge or hold that piling. Yep. Um, like just from this photo is, is uh, the perfect the per perfect presentation of a uh, fiddler crab on a bottom sweeper jig. Um, the ideal setup is always make sure you guys remove that big that big claw. Don't leave the big claw on. Just take them off. So for some reason, they intimidate sheep's head. They, they don't, I don't know. They, I've always had better bites with just the big claw. Off. Pop off the big claw, uh, and you're going to insert that hook, just the barb, just the barb section. Don't fully impale the crab. You're going to kill it. So just the barb in between the second and third leg. So right being real light, just embed it in there. And then that's like, literally, that's the, pre the presentation that the sheep's going to see when you drop it right to the bottom. Because hanging it vertically, he's going to be sitting just like that. Um, that's the, some of the reasons why I use the uh, bottom sweeper jigs. Uh, another technique for fighting in structure. Now, if you get into a, uh, a spot where it's like, okay, well, there's so much around me. I really can't get in open water. The secret to fighting a sheep in structure is try not to put too much pressure on them. Because the, the sheep, the way they are, is they're going to move the opposite direction of um, of resistance. So if you're tugging him one way, his mind's going to tell him to swim the opposite direction. So what you're going to, yeah, yeah, you're literally going to have to take your time and try to get him in open water if you can't, but if not, vertical fighting is the best way to do it. Nice and slow, easy fight, and uh, you'll be able to bring him up. Now, if he ever gets jammed up into a, um, a, you know, a piling or any of those, if he locks himself in there, same thing with talk open the bail and kind of just give him time. And then you kind of just kind of slowly roll your reel. And in time he'll, he'll nine times out of 10, he'll swim towards wherever you're pulling that line, but just don't tug enough that he feels like somebody's fighting him. Just kind of, it's kind of like leading a dog, you know, just kind of just a little tugs and he'll, he'll just start following. And then uh, we've, we've pulled out a couple, I think past few years, we pulled a couple of six, seven fishes like that, like 10 pounders, like that same exact tactic. And they've all came out. So, all right, on to the next one. All right, all right. So, this is my favorite section, guys. Uh, the whole reason I do these seminars is to uh practice conservation with um and try to preach it and try to educate everyone out there with it. So, um, as I've noticed since 2015 and now, um, big decreasing number of big fish. Uh, back in 2015, me, I used to go out with Schaefer and we used to do easily 20 fish a day like easily like not even like in a four hour window we will put 15 to 20 fishes on the boat five of them easily over 10 pounds well but the funny part is we'll bust off as many like so totally it would be a 10 fish 10 pound over 10 pound day but we'll bust off five fish over 10 pounds easily so um yeah as the years progress to now like i've noticed and i fish just as much big fish either they're leaving or they're just being harvested and then just not they're not making it back in time you know um it's one of those things where i like guys i always ask you know if you can select the harvesting as much as possible you know if fish is bigger than 20 um release them let them go i mean everyone has the right to keep what they want i don't i don't push anyone to do it but just for our fishery just to try to build a really good fishery and the reason i say that is just imagine if we built a fishery like florida Texas, Mississippi, you know, those Louisiana, those areas, you know, we build a fishery like that, that can, that we can safely harvest 50, 60 fishes a day, like as a charter and they're plentiful. And just imagine you want, you want to go offshore and catch striped bass or whatever it may be, but it's blowing 20, 25. You're not going offshore. No way you're going offshore. So you stick in the back, you know, clients, customers, kids, whatever, you know, take them sheep fishing. You know, you can, you can fill, you can, you know, have meat for the dinner table and it's fun and it's good fighting. And that's the only way I kind of just promote a lot of, of this conservation because I want to build a decent fishery. Um, like in a good day, if I get out and if I fish a good solid six, eight hours a day, if I could put two fish in the boat, that's a fantastic day, honestly, for me. Um, rarely, rarely, very rarely do I ever get any more than like five, six fish days. I'll get, you know, every day I go out, I'll pick one or two, one or two, one or two. And those are great days. Um, but never, they're not, they're not, numbers aren't here enough that we can pick five, seven, ten fish a day. Um, 
sheep rate grow rate they're, they they grow very slow they grow quickly up until about 17 18 inches and that's when they're about five years old and then when they get to 20 they're just like tall their metabolism their growth they slow you know, 20 inches and about 10 years old um and these off of North carolina numbers but like their research down there is a lot more than ours we don't really have much research up here but based off their research ours is somewhat close to that but our bigger fish are closer up to like 20 years old so um yeah selective harvesting you know small fish are fantastic two three pounders are like perfect for the grills filleting you know all that you know they're they're great uh release bigger fish if you guys can bigger fish anything over 20 um the only reason i say that just sometimes you don't have to take more than you need uh we've rolled through a couple of boat launches a couple of seasons this season and then um we've had we've had a um a spare fisherman come up with like 18 fish like yeah. 18 sheeps on a stringer i mean it, honestly you don't really need that many you know like and besides they're they're a pain in the butt to clean too if you ever had to fillet or scale one fillet one of these things you'll know you'll be going through dexter dexter knives like crazy um we do work up here uh with the uh, release over 20 program initiative that started in um north carolina and south carolina ran by i strike fishing um, but in just the past year or two, and I've been working with them, me and Dan's been working with them, Chai Chasers, uh, working with the company and trying to get Chief's Head initiated into the progress. And it's, it's happened. So now they have a program that what happens is if you guys catch, if you go out tomorrow and catch a 20 inch sheep, right? So you take the 20 inch sheep, you put it on a, uh, tape measure ruler, whatever you have out there, take a nice picture of it. And then a nice picture of you releasing it. And after you do that, you take that information, those photos, you go onto their uh, website, release over 20. Uh, you'll be able to Google it and you enter your data, your name, your address, uh, picture of the fish, where it was caught, kind of like the simple information and the photos. And then what they do is they'll send you guys home a nice release over 20 sticker uh, and also a little uh, helmet cap that I guess like back in football, when you play football, if your team wins, you get a little star, you can put it on your helmet. Well, they send you one of those and, um, and then also you get entered into their giveaway at the end of the month. And it's on their Instagram. It's a live giveaway. So the more fish you release and enter, enter, the more chances you'll get. So say you catch eight fish that month and you enter all of them. Now you have eight chances to win the uh, giveaway. So now the giveaway what is a it's prizes up to anywhere between 100 and 200 bucks. Um, the giveaways are are collaborated from sponsors like us, um, Bottom Sweeper, a uh, bunch of other companies. We send uh, release over twenty a lot of our products and a lot of our our merchandise, and they put it into a big bundle pack. And then what happens is at the end of the month they 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 check all the entries. So if there's like twenty sheep entered that month, they're gonna pull you know, they put your name in there and they pull it out. If you win, hey. Just for the good deed of releasing a fish over twenty, you get two hundred dollars worth of, you know, merchandise. I mean, that's a good trade off just for releasing a fish. Um, and my last thing is just New Jersey has no regulations or on sheep's head yet, and I'm pushing for it. I'm attending every single possible meeting that's created to um, um, to try to push this. And I've been at the meetings. I've spoken up publicly. Um, it's on their radar. It's something they're putting together, and they're trying to that and a great trigger fish so hopefully in the uh, next few years we'll be able to see something um started yeah i think one thing that's important for people to remember is the reputation of sheep set is that uh it's similar to drum you don't want to keep the bigger ones you want to catch the bigger ones because they're a lot of fun you know 100 pound black drum is incredible but you don't want to necessarily eat it um, yeah. so it's really the, the puppy drummer, really what people want to keep, you know, the four or five pounders, um, and they, they let the others go. And that's probably the, the approach that you, you would most likely want to take with, uh, with sheep's head. I mean, you know, here's Michael who catches a lot. He doesn't keep any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not I'm, I'm the cleaning same, I'm the eating. Yeah. I'm the same way with Michael. I don't. I don't keep a single fish and it's a policy on my boat. Like if you're, if you're gonna, I don't mind, you know, taking people fishing and showing the ropes, but I have a strict policy on my boat that every fish gets caught, gets released unless it's a toggle or a fluke, you know, but, yeah. but like striped bass and sheeps, uh, 
I always bring some specialty cameras, dome cameras, and then I'll get you guys fantastic photos like this one over here, my buddy Johnny. Uh, yeah, I always try to get incredible photos for everyone, you know, just uh, so you have memories of that first sheep that you caught. So I mean, that's the best way I do it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting one of those photos with you this year. Oh, 100%. We're we, going to we have to do it on the fly, though. Uh, yeah, well, we're still working on that one. Yeah. I have a couple of guys that wants to try to catch one on the fly. I got to find them first, so. Yeah. Right. right. I'll wait until you find them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can find them and I'll follow you. All right, move on to the next one. Let's see. So, yeah, we're pretty much at the end of our seminar. These are a couple of nice fishes we put in the boat last year. Uh, that's Lee Wakefield. Um, that's a good five, six pounder. Fantastic fish. Um, yep, there's there's Bobby right there. Yep. <laughs> Bobby's on the left. And then my buddy Johnny. And then this is a great picture by uh, Snakehead Stalker Trunk with the uh, bomb sweeper hanging out right out of the lip. Perfect hook set. Um. One, one good fish I had, another nice photo of a bottom sweeper just hooking just right in the corner of his mouth. And this is the uh, the baby sheep said that we found in a minnow trap. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're breeding and they're staying here. So, so I, when I was little, we had a house at Stone Harbor and we would see, we would see them around that size. Not a lot, but you would mm -hmm. see a couple every year and they would actually stick by the same pilings all, all summer. And they would be back the next year a little bit bigger. Yep, yep. They're a fantastic fish, man. Great. Yeah, let, well, let's go back to the conservation real quick. Because Eric yep. brings up a yep. good point. Yeah, you know, this is where I was talking about the larger ones don't necessarily taste as good as the, the smaller ones. Which is, I would also say, the same as striped bass. Yeah. Um, to the point where, to me, there's really not a point in keeping any because everything legal I don't want to eat. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, and it's not that they taste bad. It's just that they don't taste as good. And right. I know what the, the smaller ones taste like. Um, but, you know, to Eric's point, a lot of people in the AC area don't share that sentiment. Um, so he's pushing for the regs on the fish. Yeah. And you had talked with Jim Hutchinson a little bit about that when, when he was on, and he has he has a different perspective, but I think it's not necessarily in conflict, but just about the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, just hearing the anecdotal evidence, it seems like they aren't here the way that they were. And I don't know why, um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why. It just matters that they're here tomorrow and, and next year and the year after, so... I'm really interested to see where where that goes and what the the advisory councils say on the topic and and what they're willing to do and what they're willing to put into the research so that they can really put some numbers behind it. Right, and as I mean, as the year progresses, it's going to get to a point where if if the number reaches to a like a harvestable number that they think they'll 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 definitely try to put a good regulations on them and then we're hoping like i don't want them to be lumped up with like say like the whole weak fish speckled trout thing you know two different yeah. kind of fisheries but like hey if you catch a speckled trout here it, it abides by the spe the uh the weak fish rule right 13 yeah. inches so i don't want to get, get that um yeah as even john says uh, the meat's not as tender than a smaller catch um honestly there's so many other fish out there that taste so much better than sheep you know there's there's fluke there's there's tog yes. you know what I mean? there's so much better fish out there and i mean unless you want to take the time to clean a sheep it's not fun <laughs> uh, i advise that it's not fun but if it's something they want to do that uh, then they're more than welcome to you know they're like i said the most fantastic sizes two three two two three pound fish perfect size to eat Oh, okay. Roadkill, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Asking about uh, 2022 regs being released. Um, Let, yeah. Let's finish this up. Let's yep. finish this up and then we can go into more general. Gotcha. Yeah, I think we are. I think this is the last slide. Let's see. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah. Well, we got one more. We got Trong here. My buddy Trong had a five pounder. This is my personal best right here. Uh, 13, 13, 20 ish and some change. Um, and then another nice release photo. And that, yeah, that is, that concludes our seminar, guys. Yeah, well, Kwa, thank you for doing it. Guys, if you have any more questions, um, you know, if, even if you missed some parts earlier, make sure you get them in right now. Kwa has said that he's, he'll stick on until there's a, 
any uh, any and all questions are answered. Um, in the meantime, while we wait and see if there are any more, I mean, there were a lot of questions during this, so yeah. maybe there aren't any, but um, let me bring this up and, and we can get a little bit more general about fishing in New Jersey. Um, any word on the 2022 regs being released? Now, I don't know if you're, well, so there won't be any for Sheep's Head this year. That is confirmed. Yeah, no. Um, but, and striped bass, that's still an uh, argument. There was an argument. Well, I wouldn't say it was an argument, but it was, uh, it was a interesting meeting that we were, Qua and I were both uh, participating in or yeah. listen, at least listening before, right up until this started tonight. And th they got, they have a lot of arguing to do over yeah, this. Yes, we do. Um, over the striped bass. But then we have flounder, uh, the fluke season, and the regular seasons. That, I understand, is supposed to be done. Let's see. The day is the 14th. I think they said by April 8th. Mm-hmm. Which is, like, that's weeks later than it usually is. Yeah. Uh, opening, but, they're, yeah. but they're looking at, what, a May 4th uh, opening. opening. Um, and... Some of the options, I wish I had it here. Um, I'm sorry I don't have it available to pull up right now, but the options that they're talking about are, are interesting. Um, talking about longer season, potentially, different size limits, potentially. Um, you know, one, I think one of the options was up to five fish, uh, but it was a much bigger size. And they, were, and they even talked about uh, two fish at one size range. I think it was between 17 and 18 yeah, I think I have it here for fluke, right? Eight. You said for fluke. Yeah, for fluke. All right, so these are the three options they had for fluke. So option one was um, three fish at eighteen, so that's the regular. I think we get a shorter season or whatever the status quo one. That's status uh, quo. Yeah, that's status quo. And then first option is eighteen, uh, eighteen inch possessions three. Um, we get l longer days. Um, so I think it's longer days, shorter. Uh, then we get another option was I think 18 inches possession of four fish. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Days open wave, days open wave four, a couple of choices for days, shorter days, longer days. They have a couple of uh, longer seasons. I mean, and then they had, uh, ch option three was like 17 and a half inches at three. And then they had option four was 17 inch at three. And they had option five, which is two fish at 17 and 17.99 and one fish at 18 or bigger. Which means 17 to 18 is all you can keep except for that one that you can get over, over 18. Over 18. That to me is interesting. Yeah. I don't know how, how I feel on all, all of them yet. Um, there's a lot there, but they do have longer seasons in there as well. Yep. And to me, that is the most important thing, uh, opening up that season. Keep in mind with Fluke, uh, as an example, anything over 16 inches is, is pretty much, or I think 16 or 18 is a female. Yeah. Um, so we're that's... killing the females. Any of the big trophy shots that you see, I mean, any of the pictures that I share as like a, uh, a title slide on a video or something, that's a female. It's the larger fish. Um, so those are the ones that they're trying to trying to preserve the males are the all the ones that were forced to throw back well we all know that nature is dependent upon the female you only, you only need one male to to populate the world you, but you need a ton of females and um the way it's set up right now is we're killing all the females and we're letting all the males live so that that'll be interesting but no there there is no official word uh, as far as I know, on any of the seasons at this point um, so far. No. Um, I guess I'm still trying to push forward. Um, attending every uh, meeting, every fisheries meeting, and every time they have a public comment, I'm the first one to kind of just put it up and uh, raise my hand and just express my feelings. Um, yeah. I mean, initially, the first meeting, they weren't even aware that we even had sheep's head in our waters. Wow. Se second meeting, uh, they acknowledged, they they like, aren't you the same guy from the first one? I was like, yep. <laughs> and i'll be back again and, and, I'm, I, and i told him i was like i'm gonna be back at every single meeting until you guys figure out what's going on so uh, we got a couple of things just want to share so bobby yeah. he came around he, he guesses he, that you do know a little bit about sheep maybe <laughs> that dude is hilarious james flynn great presentation um john thank you james thank you oh, here's eric 
We have John. He's going to be checking out the the Raritan area. So we'll okay. get some some credible reports. Uh, kayak fishermen up there. Um, I actually met him out on the water up in that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's they're they're up there. It's a little harder to work, but you you they 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 they've been reported. I've I've had catches up there. So yeah. And then it looks like the, the last one coming in so far. I was actually going to ask you this off air when we were done. Yeah. You go into the the show. It's Edison, right? Yeah. Yep. I think I'll be there Friday and Saturday. I'm not doing any seminars. It's already uh, already filled out for this year, but I may be doing one next season. Um, and then Sunday I will be at Asbury. Ah. Uh, I I personally I was planning to go. Actually, I was going to take off Friday and go uh, with John Creeley. Um, And we both have not been on the water yet because the weather doesn't like us on weekends. So I took off on Friday. He has off on Friday and we are going fishing. So (laughs) we're going to be in the kayaks. Uh, Yeah. So otherwise I would absolutely go. It looks like it's going to be a great show too. Yeah. um, I I haven't hit the water in in a couple months and it's, I'm going crazy. My wife actually wants me to get the hell out there. So I'm not such an unpleasant person around the house. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a rush to get out of the water. Um, for me, I'm just, I'm just You're warm weather. I'm warm weather. Um, I I got boat stuff. To re- I got a couple of little things to button up before the season starts, and then, um, like I said, the bass will always be there. I'm not I'm not concerned. I catch bass from April all the way up until November, so it's it's not a big deal to me to miss out on a little bass action. Yeah. Um. Besides that, um, I mean. I will be moving the boat up to Raritan in April, so that'll be fun. I mean, that's when you're going to get the the blue. If it's anything like like last year, that's when you're going to get the blue fish, the the big blues. Um, yeah, you know, then uh, and the the schools of striper. You know, opening day of New York fluke last year is where I caught all the big bass that I caught and and blue fish. Um, yeah, I think the one blue was like thirty six plus inches, um, and I I love catching blue fish. Yeah, that's that. That was my plan this year. I was gonna go up there. I'm gonna hunt the flats and like you know use my flats boat for what it was. Yeah. Fly a lot of fly fishing. Try to find those big blues. Try to find those big bass that are cruising the flats. Um, yeah, try to avoid. Try to try to avoid the fleet as much as possible. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Me too. Uh, yeah, so I'll be I'll be fishing instead. Um, all right. So as we start to wrap it up, I want to let people know this will not. I repeat, will not be going on the podcast. So if you want to get this information again, you're going to have to watch a replay. Um, I'll go through it at some point over the next week or so and put chapters in so that it'll be easier to bounce between the different areas. Um, but it's it's not, that's the reason it's not on Tide Chaser. It's not a good podcast to do because it's so visual and, and this has been so interactive and, and Qua and I talked about it and he just really wanted to do something for all of you guys that weren't able to make it to the, the AC boat show myself included. And I, re- I really appreciate it. Qua. Um, if you guys haven't listened to tie chasers podcast, get it, get it on Google, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, which is where I listen. Um, you're going to love it. Uh, and then the last couple of things coming up that I have announcements for is uh, flounder course. I will just mention uh, it's, there, it's on sale right now, uh, a preseason thing, so it's not going to last forever. Uh, but I've gotten a lot of great feedback, and I'm still so happy that it's still at five stars. It won't stay at five stars uh, out of the folks that completed it. Um, we know that. Just to, you know, it's not it's not perfect, but very happy that so far it's been five star reviews on it. So if you want information on that, just reach out to me directly, or you can go and order it. Um, you can get the link to it in a lot of the videos. I'll actually add it here. Uh, and then the last thing is our podcast this week is going to be the Jim Hutchinson protecting the fisheries uh, conversation that we had back in, I guess it was the end of ju- uh, the end of January. And I know a lot of people had asked for that one specifically to be in a podcast. So that's going to be coming out. Qua, what do you have coming up? Uh, let's see. I just had Christian with his uh, sea scrape stuff. That was fun. He has some incredible work. Yeah, uh, I got Sam, Sam Scott from Blue Ridge Muskie. Ah, so that's going to be a pretty really good show. Um, we got a we got a fishmonger coming up. 
a uh, couple of couple of cool guys coming up um i have a lot of good guests coming up soon i just i'm just waiting to show season finishes because i don't want to interrupt while they're doing their show seasons and their right. seminars so once that ride rides over then uh we'll go into heavy gear and bring on the big guns yeah yeah i've i've had a couple of people that i've been waiting to have on uh, a lot of people you don't want to necessarily mention their names i will say that frank mahalik is going to be coming on he's been on on tide chasers um he's going to be coming on I incredible he's, guy yeah he is just a great guy I talked to him on the phone today for a little while just man it's one of those guys that you just like to you know interact with i mean we just get along right here you have on the screen for you qua uh fan of tide chasers if you need a guy to talk walleye let him know mm -hmm. dan, dan would love to talk to him about walleye i was gonna I, say I, I i am on a skunk fest for walleyes i, I gave up <laughs> i used to crush them back in in college up in uh bloomsburg area. you know what it is you know what it is it's it's not my it's not my time to fish you know walleye is a night thing in the middle of the non-human hours yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm old i can't do that no more i can't i can't walk the beaches at <laughs> like midnight throwing plugs anymore off the surf i can't do it no more oh come on you're still young no not even close i walk a mile and i want i'll breathe heavily down down the beach that's funny <laughs> so all right well uh everybody thanks for tuning in really appreciate it um qua thanks again man this is yeah, awesome no uh, and, and I know everybody's got a lot out of it and, uh, you know, any questions for Qua? Qua, how can they, uh, reach you? Yeah. If you guys have any questions for me, uh, reach out to my Instagram, that agent angler, or even send us email at, uh, the tie chasers podcast, um, and look for us on uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, we're all there. Any questions has anything to do with sheep's head. Uh, like I said, besides spots, I'll answer all the questions you guys have. Perfect. All right. Thanks guys. We'll catch you next week. Have yep, a good see, one. Keep those lines tight, boys. All right. See ya.